Chapter One of Stories of Balloon Adventure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. The First Balloons. Oh, what a dainty pleasure tis to sail in the air. Who first navigated the air is a question which it is by no means easy to answer. The desire to partake of this dainty pleasure seems to have taken a strong hold upon the human mind at a very remote period, as shown by the story of Daedalus, the celebrated Grecian sculptor and architect. While imprisoned in Crete, he made wings for himself and his son Icarus, with which to fly across the sea. He is said to have accomplished the flight in safety, but Icarus flew too near the sun, the heat of which melted the wax with which his wings were fastened on, and he fell headlong into the Aegean Sea. In subsequent ages, the idea of flying was the basis of all attempts to make a passage through the air. Men thought that by elongating their arms with a broad mechanical covering, they could convert them into wings and fly like birds. But they forgot that birds possess air cells which they can inflate, that their bones are full of air instead of marrow, and in their ignorance they launched themselves from towers and other high places, and came crashing to the earth. Some paid the penalty of death for their wild and daring adventure. Others, like the monk of Malmesbury, of whom Milton tells, lived to attribute their failure entirely to their having forgotten to put on a broad tail of feathers. To the brothers Stephen and Joseph Montgolfier, belongs the honour of having solved the problem of aerial navigation. They were paper makers by trade, and in their experiments naturally fixed upon paper as the most suitable material for making balloons. After many trials, they at length succeeded in 1783 in raising a balloon 35 feet in diameter to a height of 1,500 feet. It was nearly spherical in shape and was made of linen cloth covered with paper. The gas which caused the balloon to ascend was made by burning moist straw and wool on an iron brazier placed beneath the opening. The news of this marvellous achievement spread quickly throughout France, and so great was the excitement that a subscription was raised in Paris to construct a Montgolfier, as the first balloon was called. There lived at this time in the French capital a young scientist named Professor Charles, and he determined to share the glory and wealth which seemed likely to fall to the share of the Montgolfiers. He accordingly constructed a spherical balloon of varnished silk, which he inflated with hydrogen gas. On the 27th of August, 1783, it ascended from the Champ de Mars in the presence of 300,000 spectators. About an hour later, it fell in a field at Gonesse, about 15 miles off. The consternation which its descent caused is thus described. It is supposed by many to have come from another world. Many fly. Others, more sensible, think it is a monstrous bird. After it has alighted, 
there is still motion in it from the gas it still contains. A small crowd gains courage from numbers, and for an hour approaches by gradual steps, hoping, meanwhile, the monster will take flight. At length, one bolder than the rest takes his gun, stalks carefully to within shot, fires, witnesses the monster shrink, gives a shout of triumph, and the crowd rushes in with flails and pitchforks. One tears what he thinks to be the skin, and causes a poisonous stench. Again, all retire. Shame, no doubt, now urges them on, and they tie the cause of alarm to a horse's tail, who gallops across the country, tearing it to shreds. Absurd as it seems to us, the government caused a proclamation to be sent throughout the country, explaining to the inhabitants the nature of balloons, and begging them not to be alarmed. In the following month, Montgolfier exhibited his fire balloon before the king at Versailles. The performance was but a qualified success. The balloon descended only two miles away, and was much slower in its motions than that of Charles. The ascent, however, had a certain scientific value. The great discussion of the time was whether it would be possible to breathe at a certain distance from the earth. Montgolfier accordingly sent up a sheep, a cock and a duck in a cage attached to his balloon. They came down in safety and without having sustained any injury on the voyage. These were the first aerial travellers. The balloon, or large ball, was now an accomplished fact, and serious discussion followed as to whether it could be adapted for service as an airship for bearing men aloft as passengers. How this was done, and the subsequent advances in the adventurous science of aerostation, we propose to show in the following pages. End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Early Ascents It is remarkable that the man who was gifted with the ingenuity to make the first balloon had not the daring to trust his life to his own invention and the honour of being the first in the long list of adventurers in the air fell to a stranger. The man whose name was thus destined to be famous was Pilatre de Rosier, a professor in the French Museum. He made the acquaintance of Montgolfier and suggested to him what was at that time a most daring project to attach himself underneath one of the fire balloons. Seeing in this a means to gain the popularity which Charles had deprived him of, Montgolfier gladly consented, and preparations were set on foot for the sensational performance. For this experiment, Montgolfier constructed a special balloon, 46 feet in circumference and 66 feet high. It was richly decorated with drawings of eagles and wreaths. From it was suspended a circular gallery by a multitude of cords. In the middle of the lower opening of the balloon, a kind of grate was suspended. In this were placed straw and rags moistened with spirits of wine. The details of the first attempt, 
though insignificant in comparison with what has since been accomplished, are not without interest. The Montgolfier, we are told, ascended as high as the ropes, purposely placed to detain it, would allow, which was about 84 feet from the ground. He remained at this altitude for 4 minutes and 25 seconds by throwing straw and cloth into the grate and setting them on fire before the eyes of the dismayed spectators. When the intrepid adventurer returned from the sky, the experiment was pronounced to have been a great success. Pilatra was by no means satisfied with his experience and boldly announced his intention of making a proper aerial voyage in a free balloon. Accordingly, on the 21st of November 1783, an ascent was made from the Bois de Boulogne. Pilatre was on this occasion accompanied by the Marquis de Londe, who afterwards wrote an account of the first journey attempted by man through an element which, previous to Montgolfier's discovery, seemed but little fitted to support him. The balloon rose majestically to the height of about 300 feet over Paris, but it would speedily have descended had not the fire been constantly fed with straw. As they were sailing over the city, the aeronauts were startled by a loud report, and on looking up to see what had caused the noise, they were horrified to find that the balloon was on fire. I saw, says the Marquis, that the part turned towards the south was full of holes, some of which were of a considerable size. At the same time, I took my sponge and quietly extinguished the little fire that was burning some of the holes within my reach. But at the same moment, I noticed that the bottom of the cloth was coming away from the circle which surrounded it. In spite of the insecure state of their machine, the two daring travellers kept on their way till they reached the outskirts of the city, when they descended in safety. They had been among the clouds for 25 minutes. Thus ended the first trip in a free balloon. But the year 1783, so fertile in the history of ballooning, did not pass away without witnessing a more wonderful performance. Pilatra's ascent had restored the Montgolfiers to the height of popularity, and Professor Charles and his balloon were momentarily forgotten. He therefore made up his mind to outshine his rivals and set to work to prepare a sensation for the people of Paris. He constructed a balloon of alternate strips of red and yellow silk, coated with India rubber varnish. The car was of basket work, covered with cloth, painted in blue and gold, trimmed with tassels of gold and cords of silk, and was suspended from a net which covered the upper part of the balloon. A valve was fitted at the top, and worked by a cord from below to allow the gas to escape when it became necessary to descend, and ballast was carried in the form of sandbags. A barometer fastened to the car completed the outfit of this, the first complete aerial machine. So detailed were the arrangements in the Charlier, as the hydrogen balloon was called, that for a hundred years, no essential change or improvement took place on Professor Charles's invention. On the 1st of December, Charles made an ascent from the gardens of the Tuileries, accompanied by a friend named Robert. 
The balloon rose very gently in a horizontal direction and quickly reached an elevation of 1,800 feet. Then the wind carried them towards Nell. Throughout the voyage, which occupied two hours, the temperature was agreeable and the aeronauts had not the slightest apprehension for their safety. Finally, says Charles, we arrived at the plain of Nell, 27 miles from Paris, and prepared to descend towards a vast meadow. Some trees and shrubs stood round its border, and, fearing that their branches might damage the car, I threw over two pounds of ballast. We rose again, and ran along more than a hundred yards at the distance of one or two feet from the ground, so that we had the appearance of travelling in a sledge. The peasants ran after us without being able to catch us, like children pursuing a butterfly in the fields. At last we stopped and were instantly surrounded. Nothing could equal the simple and tender regard of these country folk, their admiration and their lively emotion. The aeronauts alighted from the car to receive the congratulations of those who hurried to the spot. There was still a large quantity of gas in the balloon, and Charles, in the wild delight of success, took it into his head to ascend alone. He stepped into the car and ordered the peasants to let go their hold. The balloon shot up into the air with lightning rapidity, for he had forgotten to take in ballast to compensate for the weight of his friend. I passed in ten seconds, he says, from the temperature of spring to that of winter. The cold was keen and dry, but not insupportable. I examined all my sensations calmly. I could hear myself live, so to speak, and I am certain that at first I experienced nothing disagreeable in this sudden passage from one temperature to another. Soon, however, he began to experience the intense cold. His fingers became numbed, and he was conscious of violent pains in his ears and face. After being twenty-five minutes in the air, I began to descend, and on arriving at twenty-three fathoms from the earth, I suddenly threw over two or three pounds of ballast, which I had carefully kept for this purpose. I then slowly descended upon the ground, which I had, so to speak, chosen. It is probable that in this ascent, Charles reached a height of 4,000 yards, or rather more than two miles a height which, without being dangerous, is quite sufficient to cause the aeronaut strange feelings, especially if he has travelled at the speed of an express train, rushing from the earth to the moon and stopping at the first station. Strange to say, Charles never again trusted himself in a balloon, and for the remainder of his days, rested contentedly on the laurels he had won. Far different was it with the intrepid Pilatra de Rosier. In the following year, he made an ascent in a Montgolfier from Versailles and alighted at Compagne, 40 miles away. This was the longest journey ever performed in a fire balloon. During this trip, he reached a height of 11,732 feet above the earth. We perceived beneath us only enormous masses of snow, which, reflecting the sunshine, filled the firmament with glorious light. But Pilatra was more a man of science than an adventurer, 
and he longed to devote his talent to some other account than that of mere theatrical display. By combining the Charlier and the Montgolfier, he hoped to be able to take advantage of whichever current of air would carry him to a fixed destination. His idea was that the hydrogen balloon could support the fire balloon, while the latter, with a small quantity of fuel, could cause an ascent or descent at will. On the 15th of July, 1785, Rosier ascended in his Aero Montgolfier, a fire balloon 10 feet in diameter, suspended from an air balloon 37 feet in diameter. After being up for about half an hour, and when at a height of about 3,000 feet, the balloon exploded. The unfortunate aeronaut was precipitated to the ground, a mangled mass. Thus perished the first martyr to the science of ballooning, and by a strange coincidence, he was the first mortal to navigate the air. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Ascent in England. The Chevalier Vincent Lunardi, a young Italian, is distinguished as the first aerial traveller in the English atmosphere. He made his famous voyage on the 15th of September, 1784. He was at this time secretary to the Neapolitan ambassador and, fired by an ambition to accomplish in England what had already been done in France, he applied to Sir George Howard, the governor of Chelsea Hospital, for permission to launch his balloon from the grounds of that institution as from the altar of humanity to ascend the skies. He did not possess sufficient money to construct a balloon, and in order to raise the necessary funds, he proposed that each subscriber of one guinea should be allowed to view the construction of his wonderful machine on four different occasions, besides having a chair near the globe on the day of ascending. Half a guinea entitled the subscriber to view the construction twice and to a seat on a bench near the chairs. After all expenses had been paid, he further suggested that the balance of the money obtained should be divided among the pensioners at the hospital. The matter was submitted to King George III, and he graciously gave permission for the use of the grounds. For a time, all went well. Lunardi obtained the support of several of the leading men of the day, including Sir Joseph Banks, President of the Royal Society. In the enthusiasm of the moment, Lunardi wrote to a friend, England is open to all the world either in war or peace, and a man of talent, whether liberal or mechanic, cannot fail of support and encouragement in proportion to his merits. When once a circumstance in the situation or character of a stranger has attracted the attention of an Englishman, and he has declared himself his protector and friend, a reliance may be had on his sincerity, and the friendship is permanent in duration, as it is slow in growth. Shortly afterwards, however, he describes himself as being overwhelmed with anxiety, vexation, and despair. A Frenchman named Moray had advertised an ascent, and about 60,000 people assembled to witness it. 
they patiently waited for four hours for the filling and ascension of the balloon. But in spite of every attempt, the globe absolutely refused to rise. In their disappointment, the people imagined the whole affair to be an imposture, and they rushed in and tore the balloon to pieces. This unfortunate accident seriously affected Lunardi's prospects. He too was a foreigner, and was consequently regarded as a colleague of Moray, and therefore an impostor. Fearing the consequences of failure, the permission which had been given him to use Chelsea Gardens was withdrawn. Nor could he obtain leave to make an ascent from private grounds, and it seemed as if the venture in the meantime must be given up. Though sorely disheartened, he continued his attempts to obtain a sight, and some idea of his tenacity of purpose may be had from the fact that he declared that, rather than be beaten, he would launch his balloon from the street. At length the grounds of the Honourable Artillery Company were placed at his disposal, and he hurried on his preparations with all possible speed. On the appointed day, a 150,000 spectators assembled to witness the great marvel. The Prince of Wales was present, and watched the filling of the balloon with the greatest interest, all the time asking many questions and expressing concern for the safety of the aeronaut. The catastrophe which Lunardi had all along dreaded, namely that of some hitch in the proceedings which might arouse popular indignation, was very nearly taking place. The process by which the balloon was filled with hydrogen gas was slow and elaborate, and at the time fixed for the start, the balloon was not half inflated. For some considerable time, the crowd waited patiently, but then they became indignant at the delay. Fearing to provoke the impatient and impetuous people, Lunardi decided to ascend, though the inflation was not completed. His balloon was made of oiled silk in alternate strips of blue and red, and measured a hundred feet in circumference. The car was simply a platform surrounded by a railing about four feet high. The balloon was provided with wings and oars, the wings to give it motion, if becalmed, by agitating the air and the oars to raise or lower it at will, without having to use the valve. He took with him in the car a pigeon, a dog, and a cat. At two o'clock, the last cord which bound him to earth was severed, and the balloon rose gracefully from the artillery ground, amid the most unfeigned acclamations and applause. The multitude were more than satisfied, and passed at once from incredulity and menace to the most extravagant expressions of approbation and joy. Even among those who did not witness the actual ascent, the utmost enthusiasm prevailed. It is even stated that the king, who was in conference with his ministers when the balloon was reported to be passing, broke up the council with the remark that they could resume their deliberations later, but that they might never have another chance of seeing Lunardi. Shortly after having started, the pigeon escaped, and one of the oars broke and fell to the ground. A young lady who saw the oar fall thought it was the body of the aeronaut and was so affected that she died the following day. Lunardi describes his sensations with graphic detail and it is interesting to note 
that they are exactly similar to those experienced by all aerial travellers, who naturally expect some extraordinary sensation in rising from the earth. The ascending motion was, however, altogether imperceptible, and instead of the balloon going up, he felt as if the earth had, by some unaccountable effort of nature, been suddenly precipitated from its hold, and was gradually sinking into the depths of some mighty abyss below. As the earth gradually receded, the objects on it became less and less, but as they diminished in size, they became more distinct and defined. The streets appeared as lines, all animated with dots, which were really men and women. The great metropolis itself appeared like a table set out with toys, baby houses, pepper casters, extinguishers, with here and there a dish cover, things which are called domes and spires and steeples. The Thames appeared as a small winding rivulet, while the largest vessels were no more than flat, pale decks, like pieces of driftwood on the water. Enraptured with the prospect, Lunardi wrote, It seemed as if I had left below all the cares and passions which molest mankind. I had not the slightest sense of motion in the machine. I knew not whether it went swiftly or slowly, whether it ascended or descended, whether it was agitated or tranquil, but by the appearance or disappearance of objects on earth. Shortly after three o'clock, the balloon descended in a cornfield on the common of South Mims. Here he landed the cat, as the poor animal had suffered severely from cold. Having witnessed his descent, some people came to his assistance, but, wishing to obtain a second triumph, he ordered them to stand clear. Then, throwing out all his provisions and ballast, he made a second ascent. He rose very rapidly, and in a few minutes the car was fringed with icicles. Floating clouds filled up all the space beneath. Lovely colours outspread themselves, ever varying in tone and form, now sweeping in broad lines, now rolling and heaving in huge, richly, yet softly tinted billows, while sometimes through a great opening, rift or break, appeared a level expanse of grey or blue fields at an infinite depth below. And all this time there fell a noiseless cataract of snowy cloud rocks, falling swiftly on all sides of the car in great fleecy masses, in small snow-white and glistening fragments all white and soft and swiftly rushing past giddily and incessantly. Down, down, and with all the silence of a dream, strange, lustrous, majestic, incomprehensible. On this ascent, Lunardi obtained his highest elevation, and at twenty minutes past four, descended in a meadow near Ware in Hertfordshire. He called on some labourers who were at work in a field to help him to descend, but they were too much terrified to do anything but stare at him open-mouthed. At length a young woman took hold of one of the cords which he had thrown out and called on the men to assist her. They had by this time got over their astonishment and assisted to drag the balloon to the earth. The aeronaut was then taken to the house of Mr Baker, the Member of Parliament for Hartford, who treated him with frank and generous hospitality. The voyage had terminated favourably, 
but Lunardi had to pay the penalty of his success in a severe fit of sickness brought on by the reaction after weeks of suspense, contempt and fatigue which he had undergone. When he recovered, he was the star of the hour. He was everywhere received with applause, respect and friendship. The Prince of Wales presented him with a handsome watch, and he was received at court by the king, who expressed a warm interest in his adventures and personal safety. Lunardi made several successful ascents after this in different parts of the kingdom, and at a subsequent period in Italy. The favourite of kings and princes, however, died at Genoa in 1806, in a state of great poverty. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Across the Channel Towards the close of the year 1784, the inhabitants of the ancient port of Dover were in a state of great excitement, for it was whispered about that an attempt was to be made to cross from Dover to France by balloon. At this time, it was the chief ambition of French aeronauts to achieve the first passage across the Channel, and the remembrance of Lunardi's ascent was still fresh in men's minds, so that the preparations for the daring undertaking were watched by the townsfolk with more than usual interest. In the courtyard of Dover Castle, a wooden staging was erected to support the balloon, and arrangements were made for starting on the 1st of January 1785. A few days before this date, the celebrated French aeronaut, Blanchard, arrived to complete his preparations. He was accompanied by an American doctor named Jeffries, who provided all the necessary funds in return for a seat in the car. Blanchard was very anxious to make the ascent alone, but the doctor was determined to accompany him, even in spite of the clause which the aeronaut introduced into their agreement in the hope of shaking off the persistent medico. By it, Jeffreys bound himself on his word of honour as a gentleman and an officer, to jump out of the car the moment his further presence and weight should jeopardise the success of the venture and imperil Blanchard's life. On the date fixed for the ascent, the wind was blowing steadily from the east. It was therefore impossible to start and it was not until the 7th of January that a favourable breeze was obtained. Then Blanchard announced to the Mayor of Dover that it was his intention to start. In order to give notice to the inhabitants, the Governor of the Castle ordered three cannons to be fired at half-past eight in the morning, and the whole population of Dover together with a great number of strangers, crowded down to the beach in the greatest expectancy. At ten o'clock, the aeronauts made their final preparations by testing the strength of the netting and the safe condition of the balloon itself. In the car were nine little bags filled with sand, a barometer, a thermometer, a compass, some provisions, and two magnificent flags emblazoned with the arms of England and France. Three hours later, Blanchard and Jeffreys entered the car. They were dressed alike, in a sort of brown woolen slop, waistcoat of the same material, knitted drawers covering the feet, and tight ankle boots. 
They both wore leather gloves and a scarlet woolen comforter, twisted several times round their necks. Blanchard had a cap of light grey plush covering his ears, Jeffreys a thick sailor's cap. He also wore a light girdle of silk to which were fastened his watch and his handkerchief, and beneath which the form of his favourite snuff-box was evidently apparent. At a quarter past one, the balloon was released from its fastenings, but the weight of the car proved too great, and it slowly sank instead of ascending. By throwing overboard nearly all the ballast, however, it rose gently and drifted over the channel, followed by the cheers of the assembled spectators. The crowd gazed after the balloon till it appeared as a mere speck in the heavens, while those who were the happy possessors of telescopes were eagerly questioned as to what was going on. Suddenly, the balloon descended, as it were, into the sea, and when this was made known, a cry of horror arose. But it soon was seen ascending, and shortly afterwards it quite disappeared from view. We will now accompany the aeronauts in their adventurous flight across the channel. For a time all went well, and they greatly enjoyed the consternation which their appearance caused among the crews of several vessels over which they passed. When about a third of the journey was accomplished, they found that they were rapidly descending, and at once threw out the remainder of the ballast. The advantage gained was but momentary, for shortly afterwards the rising of the mercury in their barometer denoted that they were again descending. Again they lightened the car by throwing out their books and provisions, the French coast was now in sight, and success was well within their reach. But again, the balloon approached perilously near the water. Hastily, everything that remained in the car was thrown out, and when this did not prove enough, the aeronauts stripped themselves of all but their most necessary garments. Then, the balloon slowly ascended. We can readily imagine the feelings which were uppermost in Geoffrey's mind at this moment. The question, what shall be dispensed with next, must have caused him to shudder. Fortunately, he was not called upon to sacrifice himself, for the balloon rose rapidly, and exactly two hours from the time of starting, passed over the high ground between Cape blanc Ney and Calais, and it is remarkable that the balloon at this time rose very fast, so that it made a magnificent arch. In passing over the forest of Guin, the two adventurers descended as low as the tops of the trees, and Dr. Jeffreys seized hold of one of the uppermost branches, and brought the balloon to a standstill. The great machine then became fast between a couple of oaks, and the aeronauts got out of their car by the aid of the branches. When they reached terra firma, their feelings seemed quite to have overcome them, for, we read, they fell on each other's necks. They were in a state of excitement, closely bordering on madness. After they had embraced one another, Geoffrey shouted out, Oh, look, look, you have now standing before you the two most celebrated men in all France or England. And Blanchard added, Yes, indeed, the most celebrated men in the whole world. Their only audience was the trees. Meanwhile, two little boys who had witnessed the descent ran off and aroused the inhabitants of the village, 
who now came flocking to render assistance to the daring men and offer them hospitality, which was very welcome, for both Blanchard and his companion were suffering severely from cold and hunger. When they were sufficiently refreshed, they proceeded to Calais, where they were welcomed as heroes. Every honour, even to the freedom of the city, was conferred on Blanchard. The King of France commanded him to appear at court, and His Majesty awarded him a pension of fifty pounds. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Flood and Fire One of the most remarkable figures in the story of balloon experiment and adventure is Count Zambacari of Bologna. A sailor by profession, he fell into the hands of the Turks in 1787 and was kept a close prisoner in the Banyo at Constantinople for three years. He had already made several uneventful voyages in the clouds, and during his long captivity he dreamed of means of guiding himself once more upon the waves of air. His idea was that by burning oil or spirits of wine under an inverted parachute, a balloon could be made to ascend ten times higher and ten times more rapidly than by the simple method of throwing sand overboard. Accordingly, when he regained his liberty, he hastened to England in the hope of obtaining the funds necessary for the experiment but in this he was disappointed. The danger of fire was a risk too great to be overlooked in his proposals, and so his scheme was not regarded with favour. But to such a man as Zampakari, fear did not exist. He therefore made his way to his native Italy. At Bologna, he succeeded in raising the money, and an ascent was arranged in company with Dr. Grassetti and Pascal Andrioli. The ascent took place at night, in a fire balloon, which Zambacari had made more dangerous and complicated than it was already, by the addition of a rudder. The intention of the aeronauts was to take advantage of the strong northeast wind which was blowing and journey to Milan. They took with them instruments and a lantern by which to make observations. The departure was badly regulated, and from the first, misfortune followed them. The lamp, which was intended to increase their power of ascent, became useless, and the light of their lantern was too feeble to enable them to observe their instruments. The balloon ascended with great rapidity, and in an incredibly short time they found themselves in a region of excessive cold. The suddenness of the change of temperature coupled with the fact that Zambacari had scarcely broken his fast for 24 hours, produced their natural result. He fell on the floor of the car in a death-like faint. Grassetti also became unconscious. Andrioli alone preserved his senses, but even he suffered excessively. His whole attention was now occupied in trying to revive his companions. Zambacari was the first to recover, and, like a man newly awakened from a dream, asked his companion, What is the news? Where are we? What time is it? Andrioli answered, that the compass was broken, and their whereabouts was therefore a mystery. But, as he spoke, a sound, 
muffled and almost inaudible, fell on his ear. Ah, the breaking of waves, he cried. In fearful anxiety, the two men listened. It was now about three o'clock in the morning, and the balloon was slowly descending through a layer of whitish clouds. The noise of waves, tossing in wild uproar, became louder and louder. The next instant, the horrified aeronauts saw the sea below them violently agitated. Zambakari seized a large bag of sand, but before he could throw it overboard, the car touched the waves and the waters of the Adriatic poured through the slender basket work. The panic-stricken aeronauts blindly cast out everything they could lay their hands on. Without a word being spoken, without pausing to think what would be the consequences, they threw into the sea their money, instruments, ballast and clothing. Still the balloon did not rise. Then with knives they set desperately to work and cut away everything that was not absolutely necessary to the balloon. Thus lightened, they ascended with fearful rapidity to such a prodigious elevation that they had great difficulty in hearing each other, even when shouting at the top of their voices. The adventurers suffered severely. They were suddenly covered with a coating of ice. Zambakari's fingers were frozen, and he could no longer make use of his hands. Grassetti lay in the bottom of the car, hardly showing any signs of life. Andrioli bled profusely. On a parallel with them, the astonished men saw the moon shining, red as blood. After traversing these elevated icy regions for about half an hour, the balloon again fell into the sea. It was pitch dark, and the aeronauts worn out by what they had already endured, abandoned themselves to the fate which seemed inevitable. The balloon was now more than half empty, and acted as a sail, which dragged the car through the waves. Often it was entirely covered with water. At length the welcome daylight appeared, and showed the half-drowned men that they were within four miles of the shore, and rapidly driving towards it. But they were again doomed to disappointment. Suddenly a land wind sprang up, and carried them out to sea. Some boats put off from the shore, and for a time the hope of rescue lightened their hearts. But when the sailors came near enough to make out the curious object, they made all sail to get away from the spot as quickly as possible. It was now, says Zembakari, broad daylight, but all we could see was the sea the sky, and the death that threatened us. Fortunately, at the last moment, a vessel hove in sight, and the captain, better informed than the others, saw at once what had happened, and sent his boat to their rescue. The sailors threw the weary adventurers a stout rope, which they had only sufficient strength to fasten to the car. They were drawn on board, fainting with exposure. Their perilous voyage had occupied eight hours. Relieved of the weight of the aeronauts, the balloon rose at once into the air, in spite of the efforts of the sailors to capture it. The boat received a severe shock from its ascent, as the rope was still attached to it so the sailors hastened to cut themselves free. At once the balloon mounted with incredible rapidity and was lost in the clouds, where it disappeared forever from their view. 
The captain of the vessel did everything in his power to relieve the suffering of his guests. He carried them to Ferrara, and they made their way to Pola, where they were welcomed with great kindness. Here, Zambakari had to have his frozen fingers amputated. In spite of this terrible warning, the adventurous sailor aeronaut was determined to make another experiment with his spirit lamp. Accordingly, on the 21st of September, 1812, he made an ascent from Bologna, along with a companion named Signor Bonaga. The upward journey was accomplished in safety and without adventure. On descending, however, the grapnel caught suddenly in a tree. The suddenness and violence of the shock overturned the lamp and set the whole machine on fire. The two men instantly jumped from the car. Bonaga was picked up, fearfully injured, but he escaped with his life. Zambakari was killed on the spot. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Father of Modern Ballooning The most remarkable figure in connection with ballooning in England is that of Charles Green. His career lasted for 36 years, during which he made 1,400 ascents. Three times he crossed the sea, and twice he fell into it. To him are due two important improvements in the management of balloons. The use of ordinary coal gas for inflation, and the introduction of the guide rope. This is a rope several hundred feet long, which is allowed to hang downwards from the car and by means of which the aeronaut is able to regulate the height to which his balloon rises. If the balloon sinks very low, a considerable length of the guide rope rests on the ground. The balloon, thus lightened, rises again. If it ascends too high, the weight of the rope tends to bring it down again, and so a uniform elevation is rendered possible. Green, with his unique experience, reduced ballooning to a routine, and few accidents attended his ascents, which were not, however, without adventure. The greatest of all the veterans' dangers, however, was caused by a most malicious trick, the perpetrator of which was unfortunately never discovered. In the year 1832, he ascended from Cheltenham. The balloon rose from the ground steadily, but no sooner was weight put on the car than it fell over, and the contents were thrown to the ground. Someone had partially cut the ropes of the car in such a way that the damage was not noticed till its effects were experienced. The aeronaut and his companion had only time to seize hold of the hoop to save themselves from being dashed to the ground. The balloon flew upwards with frightening velocity, and before Green could obtain possession of the valve string, which the first violence of the accident had placed beyond his reach, an altitude of upwards of 10,000 feet had been reached. Their danger was terrific. They clung to the hoop with desperate energy, not daring to trust any portion of their weight upon the margin of the car, which hung suspended by a single cord beneath their feet. Their only hope of safety lay in their ability to hang on till the exhaustion of the gas made the balloon descend. To the horror of their situation, a fresh danger was added. 
Under the strain of the unequal pressure, the network which covered the globe began to give way. Mesh after mesh broke with a succession of reports like the discharge of a pistol. Through the opening thus created, the balloon began to ooze slowly out, and presently took the form of a huge hourglass floating in the upper air. Truly a singular and awful spectacle. Thus the aeronauts hung for a considerable time, expecting every moment to be hurled to the earth by the escape of the balloon. At length they began to descend. When within a few feet from the ground, the catastrophe they had so long dreaded took place. The balloon, forcing its way through the netting, escaped with a loud explosion, and the aeronauts fell to the earth insensible. It was at first feared that they were dead, but with great difficulty they were at length restored to consciousness and health. Green's balloon, one of the most famous and longest-lived aerostats of which any record has been kept, was called the Great Nassau, and it received its name after accomplishing a most remarkable journey from London to Germany. It was constructed by Green himself, of the finest silk, specially spun, woven and dyed. It was pear-shaped, 60 feet in height, 50 in breadth, and had a capacity of 85,000 cubic feet. The car measured 9 feet long and 4 broad. It was oval in shape, and the bottom was fitted with a cushion which could be used as a bed if necessary. On the 7th of November, 1836, Green, accompanied by two friends, Mason and Holland, set out. They carried a fortnight's provisions, and, not knowing to what quarter of the continent they might be blown, they had provided themselves with passports to every country in Europe. Born on a fresh breeze, the balloon sailed in a southeasterly direction over Kent, and at four o'clock, three hours after they started, they came in sight of the sea. They now came under the influence of a current setting towards the north, which would inevitably have carried them out over the open sea. A quantity of ballast was therefore thrown out, and the balloon rose until a favourable stream of southwestern air was reached. Without a thought of danger, the voyagers left England and floated above the channel. Behind them, the white cliffs sparkled with many lights. Below, the water was dotted here and there at great distances, with vessels whose lights glimmered and twinkled like distant stars, as the ships rose and fell on the waves. Before them hung a huge black cloud curtain, stretched from sea to sky, as though to bar their farther advance. Into its folds they plunged, and then they heard nothing, saw nothing, till at the end of an hour the well-known lights of Calais shone ahead. Preparations were now made to pass the night in as great safety and comfort as possible. A lamp was lighted, and hung so as to prevent all danger of explosion, and the provisions were spread out. With many a joke, says Mason, touching the high flavour and exalted merits of our several viands, which, however agreeable under the circumstances, will not bear repeating, we contrive to do ample justice to the good cheer. Darkness overhung the landscape, and for miles, as far as the eye could reach, nothing could be seen but clusters of lights indicating the position of a town, while away on the horizon 
glowed a dull red mist, like the reflection of some mighty conflagration, which when reached proved to be only the peaceful lights of a busy town. Streets, squares, and the whole plan of a town, drawn by the lamps, could be easily traced by the voyagers, as the balloon hurried them from point to point. It would be difficult to give an idea of what sort of effects such a scene in such circumstances produces. To find oneself transported in the darkness of night, in the midst of vast solitudes of air, unknown, unperceived, in secret and in silence, exploring territories, traversing kingdoms, watching towns which come into view, and pass away again before one can examine them in detail, is grand, sublime. Towards midnight, all signs of life disappeared, and, as is the custom in continental towns, the lights were extinguished. There was no moon, and the brilliancy of the stars served but to make the gloom more apparent. To the voyagers, it seemed as if they were making their way through an interminable abyss. The solitude was profound. This, together with their ignorance of their whereabouts, heightened the novelty of their situation. Thus they sailed on till three o'clock in the morning, not, however, without considerable suffering from the cold, which froze all the liquors in the car. Shortly afterwards, the aeronauts were startled by a sudden explosion. The silk quivered, and the car, violently shaken, sunk into the gloomy abyss. There was not time to ask, what's happened? When a second and a third shock followed, threatening to wrench the basket from its fastenings. It was afterwards found that one of the ropes, soaked with water and made rigid by the intense cold, had yielded to the pressure of the expanding gas, and so caused the alarming shock. When day dawned, the aeronauts looked anxiously abroad, in the hope of discovering their position, but without success. They accordingly decided to effect a landing at the first suitable spot. Their first attempt failed, for so great was the force of the wind near the earth that the balloon was swept towards a wood, and accident was only averted by skilful handling. Another attempt was successful, and about seven o'clock in the morning, the anchor held in a valley near the town of Wielberg in the Duchy of Nassau. The journey of 500 miles had occupied 18 hours. The hospitable Germans welcomed the wanderers with great enthusiasm, and before they left for England, one of their lady admirers bestowed on the trusty balloon the name of the Great Balloon of Nassau. Thus, says Mason, ended an expedition which, whether we regard the length of the journey or the time occupied in it, may justly be considered as one of the most interesting and most important ever undertaken. One of Green's favourite and most frequently quoted sayings was, The best parachute is a balloon. The others are bad things to have to deal with. And indeed, he had good grounds for his opinion. On the 24th of July, 1837, he ascended from London for the purpose of testing a new parachute. The inventor, Robert Cocking, thought he had discovered the true principle on which parachutes should be made. Previous to his time, they had been constructed so as to descend in a concave form, like that of an open umbrella. The aeronaut came down in a basket, 
not, as in more modern times, suspended from a ring, and the swinging was so violent during the descent that sometimes the basket was almost in a horizontal position. Cocking determined to remedy this, and constructed a parachute in the form of a large inverted cone. The large upper rim was made of hollow tin, a most brittle and therefore unsuitable material. Experts were by no means satisfied with Cocking's invention, but all they could say failed to shake his confidence in his parachute. Accordingly, on the eventful day, he went up, dangling by a rope, 50 feet long, from the bottom of the car of Green's Great Nassau Balloon. Knowing well what would happen the instant the great weight of the parachute was detached, the aeronaut provided a small balloon inside the car, filled with atmospheric air and fitted with two mouthpieces, for himself and the friend who accompanied him. Green made the trip sorely against his better judgment, and he was so ill at ease regarding the termination of the adventure that he refused to touch the latch which was to free the parachute from the balloon. This presented no obstacle to Cocking, who procured a line of the required length and had it fastened to the latch above and led down to the basket of the parachute. Considerable difficulty was experienced in rising to a suitable height, partly owing to the resistance to the air by the expanded parachute, and partly owing to its weight, which was about half a ton. At length, when the great Nassau was over Greenwich at an elevation of about a mile, Green called out, How do you feel, Mr Cocking? Though a distance of 50 feet separated the aeronauts, each syllable was heard with perfect distinctness in the silence of that region, of which they were, for the time being, the only inhabitants. Never better in my life, replied Cocking. But perhaps you will alter your mind, suggested Green. By no means answered Cocking warmly. But how high are we? Upwards of a mile. I must go higher, Mr. Green. I must be taken up two miles before I liberate the parachute. The aeronaut replied that this was impossible if he wished to descend by daylight. Very well, said Cocking. If you will not really take me any higher, I shall say goodbye. Again, Green tried to save his friend from what he regarded as a foolish risk and called out, Now, Mr. Cocking, if your mind at all misgives you about your parachute, I have provided a tackle up here which I can lower down to you and haul you up into the car, and nobody need be the wiser. Certainly not. Thank you all the same. I shall now make ready to pull the latch cord. Good night, Mr. Cocking. Good night, Mr. Green. A pleasant voyage to you. Good night. There was a silence, as awful as it was perfect, and the aeronauts above felt a jerk upon the latch but it was not sufficient to detach the parachute. There were only a few seconds of intense suspense. Then a vigorous pull was given. The balloon bounded aloft, and cocking in his parachute descended slowly and steadily towards the earth. So far his invention fully realised his expectations. All went well for a few minutes when suddenly those below who were watching with glasses gave a loud cry of horror. The parachute leaned on one side and then lurched to the other. 
the tin tubing had evidently given way, for the large upper circle collapsed. For a few seconds it was hid in a cloud, and when it came in sight again, the whole thing turned over, and then, like a closed-up umbrella, it shot straight down to the earth. The descent was so rapid, says an eyewitness, that the mean rate of the fall was not less than twenty yards a second. Within three hundred feet from the ground, the basket became detached. This completed the catastrophe. Cocking was found in a field at Lee, quite insensible. On being lifted, he uttered a moan, and in ten minutes, he was dead. Meanwhile, how had the aeronauts fared in the great Nassau? With a sidelong swirl, the balloon sprang upward, the two men crouching down in the car, while Green clung to the valve line to allow the gas to escape. So rapid was their flight that the resistance of the air prevented the gas from escaping at the top, and it came rushing downwards. At once they seized the mouthpieces of the atmospheric air balloon, and to these they owed their lives, for the gas continued to pour down upon them for so long a time and in such volume that they would certainly have been suffocated. As it was, they were completely blinded for some minutes. At length, the great Nassau, having attained a height of nearly 24,000 feet, slowly descended, and the aeronauts safely reached the ground near Maidstone. Many pages might be filled with the thrilling narrative of Green's adventures, but one other must suffice. On one occasion, in company with a gentleman named Rush, he was blown out to sea in the Great Nassau. Seeing some vessels from which he knew he should obtain assistance, he commenced a rapid descent in the direction of the Nor. The car struck the water about two miles north of Sheerness. The wind was blowing fresh, and, owing to the buoyancy of the balloon and the enormous surface it presented, it was swept over the water at a speed which left the boats that had come to the rescue far behind. So great indeed was its progress that the aeronauts were dragged through every wave, and there was every prospect of them being drowned. Seeing that they could not be overtaken, Green, by a clever manoeuvre, threw over his large grapnel. Fortunately, in their course lay a sunken wreck, and in its shell-covered sides the iron eventually got a hold, and arrested their headlong flight. A boat soon came up, and by means of ropes rescued the voyagers. The danger was not yet over, however, for no boat could venture near the aerial monster, which struggled and tossed and bounded from side to side. It would have capsized in an instant any boat that came near. It was impossible to do anything till the services of an armed boat's crew were obtained from a revenue cutter. The men fired muskets loaded with ball cartridge into the restive globe, and it sank down lifeless upon the waves, but not before the silk had been riddled with 26 bullet holes. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Over the Alps. In the early days of the year 1846, a balloon rose slowly over the Alps. That gigantic obstacle 
which even the most daring aeronauts avoid with unspeakable fear. In the car sat a solitary aeronaut, a young man named Arben. Darkness came on, bringing storm in its train, and the balloon was swept into the midst of those lofty, white-mantled peaks. The moon came out from behind the clouds, spreading a silvery shimmer over peak and pinnacle and precipice of snow, and revealing to the gaze of the daring adventurer a sight such as no mortal eye had ever beheld. All night long the storm raged, and the aeronaut, struggling against the almost overpowering influence of the intense cold, doled out his ballast grain by grain. Again and again he was in danger of being precipitated into the immense crevasses of the murder glass, or crushed against the towering peaks. In the midst of this appalling situation, he exulted in the knowledge that he sailed among the mountains over which human foot had never trod. Then occurred to him the curious idea of throwing a bottle overboard, which might serve as a witness to future centuries that a French aeronaut had crossed there. When day dawned, he found himself over the plains of Piedmont, and shortly afterwards descended at a small village four miles from Turin, to which city he was carried by the enthusiastic people in a triumphal procession. A few months later, Arban made an ascent from Trieste. On this occasion, the car was too heavy for the balloon to raise. The wind was blowing a hurricane, but this could not deter him from descending. With the rapidity of thought, he detached the car from the globe, and before the assembled people realised what he was doing, he flew upwards into space. The wind carried him rapidly towards the Adriatic, and as he disappeared from view, he was seen standing upon the hoop, saluting the crowd with one hand, and holding on to the cords of the balloon with the other. Fearing disaster, a number of boats set out to aid him, but they returned at nightfall without having even had a sight of the balloon. Meanwhile Arben, after reaching a great elevation, gradually approached nearer and nearer to the waves. He had no means of rising and was soon immersed in the stormy waters of the Adriatic. But the balloon, though too weak to support his weight in the air, had still sufficient buoyancy to drag him through the water. For hours he was trailed over the sea, now plunged into the waves, now carried over them, as the balloon rose and fell with the varying wind. Night came on. His limbs were stiff and cold. Even his Herculean frame could not long withstand these rude shocks, and he felt his strength rapidly failing. Still he clung to the hoop with indomitable energy. His eyes closed, and he knew no more until the sound of oars fell on his ear, and he cried for help with all his remaining strength. His cry was answered. Some sailors returning from the Italian shore quickly rowed towards him and saved his life. This daring and impetuous aeronaut met his death a few years later in an ascent from Barcelona. His wife was to accompany him, but as the wind blew off the land, Arban refused to expose her to so great a danger, and set off alone. His car was last seen like a mere speck in the heavens. The Spaniards waited for several days for tidings of the traveller, but none came. 
his career had come to an end in the depths of the Mediterranean. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Adventures In the summer of the year 1847, the veteran aeronaut Henry Coxwell accomplished what is, without doubt, the most perilous descent in the annals of aerostation. In the first half of the present century, there were numerous pleasure gardens in London, from which balloon ascents were of frequent occurrence. Ever on the search for sensation, the manager of one of these gardens arranged for a balloon ascent by night with a firework display by the aeronaut. A balloonist named Mr. Gibson undertook the difficult and dangerous task and invited Coxwell to accompany him. The day chosen for the ascent gave every indication of suitable weather. Not a breath of wind stirred the trees. The balloon was successfully inflated and a framework was attached to which the fireworks were fastened. When all was in readiness for the start, the sky became overcast, the atmosphere close and oppressive, flashes of lightning were seen in the sky, and the distant rumble of thunder gave warning of an approaching storm. Then the question arose, was the ascent to take place or not? Some were of the opinion that to go up under such conditions was highly dangerous and would be sure to end in disaster. Others thought that the weather should make no difference and that there was no more danger in ascending then than at any other time. Coxwell favoured the latter view and declared that if an immediate ascent was made and everything in order and managed properly, no harm could possibly result. The two aeronauts, accompanied by two friends, accordingly entered the car. Coxwell jumped up into the hoop to see that the neck of the balloon was clear and to give notice to Gibson when the valve required to be opened. The cable was slipped and, amid the shouts of the spectators, the balloon rose, leaving behind it a train of fire in ever-changing colours. All went well till they had attained an altitude of some 4,000 feet, when a blinding flash of lightning appeared and a splitting thunder crash was heard, apparently right over the balloon. The crowds in the garden, no less than the aeronauts, were impressed with the sudden and awful report, and a profound silence reigned for a few minutes. The balloon still ascended with great rapidity, and Coxwell, from his seat in the hoop, saw that the silk was greatly distended. On prompt and skilful conduct alone depended their safety. A few more blinding flashes followed. The globe seemed on the point of bursting. Now was the time to open the valve and allow some gas to escape. Coxwell endeavoured by signs to warn Gibson of the danger, but the aeronaut paid no attention. At last, Coxwell shouted out, If the valve is not opened, the balloon will burst. As he spoke, the car dropped several feet. In terror, the aeronauts looked up, fearing that the network had given way, but it was so dark that they could see nothing except the gaslit metropolis rushing up to meet them at fearful speed. 
Their headlong fall was suddenly stayed, and a vivid flash of lightning enabled them to see what had happened. The view was by no means reassuring. The silk was torn right across for about 16 feet. Death seemed inevitable. All this time, Coxwell had remained in the hoop, and it was indeed fortunate that he did so. As they fell, he noticed that the line which connected the neck of the balloon was strained to its utmost tension, and he thought that if he cut it, the lower half of the balloon would expand and form a kind of parachute which would moderate the rapidity of their descent. Contrary to the wishes of his companions, he did so, and at once their downward flight was checked. But all danger was not yet over. Indeed, it seemed as if they had only exchanged one danger for another still more terrible, for the sparks from the paper cases shot up among the gas through the tear in the silk, and once more the thunder roared and the lightning flashed, so that a more frightful descent to the earth could not possibly be imagined. As they neared the ground, ballast bags were collected and the grapnel was got ready for use, though there seemed but little chance of either being effective among the thickly clustering houses and hard pavements. Fortunately, the balloon fell in a newly formed street in the West End of London, while the network caught in some scaffold poles, so that the force of their fall was greatly broken, and they all reached the ground uninjured. Another ascent which Coxwell made on the 16th of October, 1853, is also well worth recording, on account of the amusing as well as the dangerous aspect of the adventure, and as showing that after the aeronaut had safely passed the perils of the air, he had often others, no less real, to encounter on land. On the day already mentioned, Coxwell had arranged an ascent from one of the pleasure gardens in the east end of London. But the morning broke wet and windy, and it was feared that the exhibition would have to be postponed. As the day wore on, the sun broke through the clouds, and the wind moderated. All preparations were made, and everyone stood at his place, waiting for the signal from the aeronaut to inflate the balloon. It was late in the afternoon before the word was given, and at six o'clock, the sylph, as the balloon was called, was not quite half full. This presented a serious difficulty, for the wind had risen again, and was blowing in fitful gusts, which the balloon in its present state was ill-calculated to withstand. Owing also to the lateness of the hour, only another half hour could be spent in inflating. Fortunately, this was sufficient to give the sylph the necessary ascending power. The balloon rose rapidly, but a sudden gust of wind, more violent than the rest, caught the machine and drove it along in a downward direction. Quickly, Coxwell threw out two bags of sand, but this was not sufficient to enable the sylph to rise, and to his horror, he saw himself carried directly towards a tall chimney. A collision was certain, and he had only time to seize hold of the edge of the car when the crash took place. Down hurtled the bricks and mortar, while the balloon, undamaged, soared aloft on the freshening breeze. In a short time, the barometer indicated an immense elevation. As he did not wish to go any higher, 
the aeronaut pulled the valve line, but no amount of tugging would open the shutters. On looking to see what was the cause of the hitch, he found that, in the hurry of filling the balloon, a fold had been allowed to form in the silk. This effectually prevented the valve from working, so there was nothing for it but to allow the balloon to take its own course and wait till the gas had exhausted itself sufficient to permit of a descent. After attaining an elevation of two miles and a half, the sylph began to travel towards the earth. On the descent, says Coxwell, I noticed a splendid meteor which was below the level of the car and apparently about 600 feet distant. It was blue and yellow, moving rapidly in a northeasterly direction, and became extinguished without noise or sparks. Its size was half that of the moon. I could not but feel that if such another visitor were to cross my path, the end of the sylph and its master would be at hand. Shortly after eight o'clock, the balloon descended in a field near Basingstoke. It was by this time quite dark, and as far as the eye could reach, there was no sign of a dwelling. Not knowing where he was, Coxwell shouted in the hope of attracting some passer-by, but no answer was returned and he began to fear that he had landed in some very outlandish place. He continued, however, to shout till he was hoarse, but with no better result, so he reluctantly made up his mind to spend the night in the car. After a supper of sandwiches, he lay down and tried to sleep, but the thought that perhaps he might be able to obtain assistance at no great distance kept him awake, and he determined to explore the neighbourhood. Crossing the field, he came to a gate which led into a lane. Cautiously, the aeronaut groped his way by the side of the hedge, and in a quarter of an hour, he saw the welcome glimmer of a light in the window of a farmhouse. Now my troubles are over, thought Coxwell, as he clambered over the stile. But they were only just beginning. Hardly had he reached the top bar, when a great fierce Newfoundland dog rushed at him. Without pausing to see whether the animal was chained or not, he took to flight nor did he pause or look back till he had gained the safety of the field in which the balloon lay. Such an experience was not to be repeated, so he lay down again in the car. Just as he was dozing off, he heard voices coming in his direction, and thinking that some villagers who might have seen the balloon descend were coming to his assistance, he got up and shouted, Here I am, and the balloon all safe. At once the talking ceased, and a gentle hush occurred, followed by the sound of hurried footsteps in full retreat. Coxwell shouted that they had nothing to fear, but his voice only accelerated their flight. He then came to the conclusion that there must be houses at no great distance, and resolved to make one more attempt to procure assistance. Arming himself with a stout piece of iron, he sallied forth, and after walking about two miles, he came to a number of cottages. He strolled up the chief street of the village, and in turning a corner suddenly, he found himself face to face with a workman on his way home. Coxwell lost no time in making known his condition, but his story excited suspicion instead of sympathy, 
and the only help he could get out of the man was a recommendation to make known his wants at the village inn. He hurried off in the direction indicated, and on the way met a policeman. Going up to the officer, he asked him where he was, and explained the circumstances. Again he was met with distrust, and in reply to his question, What county am I in? The constable said, You don't know what county you're in, don't you? Well, if you don't clear out of this, you'll know that you're in the county jail soon enough. Finding that it was only wasting words to try and get any information, Coxwell set off for the inn. But when he arrived, the whole place was in darkness, and no answer was given to his repeated knocks. In disgust, he turned away, and went back to his balloon in the field, where he spent the night. Early on the following morning, some farm labourers on their way to work across the field found the balloon and helped Coxwell to exhaust the gas. He breakfasted with the farmer and afterwards went down to the inn where the mysterious treatment of the previous night was explained. A few days before, a gang of thieves had robbed many of the shops and houses and every stranger was looked upon with distrust. The landlord said he had heard his knocking, but he had been warned by the policeman that there was a dangerous fellow about, so he did not open the door. In expressing regret for the unfriendly reception the aeronaut had had, the landlord said at parting, Another thing you must not forget that you have come among the Hampshire hogs, and that a grunt or two is all in character. In an ascent from the Crystal Palace on the 18th of April, 1863, Coxwell had a very narrow escape. On this occasion, he was accompanied by Glacier, the scientist. The start did not augur well for a pleasant voyage for suddenly the rope which held the balloon to the ground broke, and the aeronauts were started on their trip sooner than they intended. The balloon rose rapidly, and in less than a quarter of an hour reached the height of 10,000 feet. Here they encountered a strong southward current of air, which bore the balloon along at a rapid pace. They were shut in by the clouds and had no idea of their whereabouts. But as the barometer now indicated an elevation of 24,000 feet, there was no cause for any uneasiness. When the aeronauts had been in the air about an hour and a half, they thought it advisable to descend in order to find out their position. A rapid drop brought them out of the clouds and within 10,000 feet of the earth. Suddenly Coxwell, who was looking over the side of the car, cried out, What's that? His companion joined him and they were not long in making out their position. There was not a moment to spare, for below them lay the bold promontory of Beachy Head, and they were almost directly above the sea. Quick, shouted Coxwell, we must save the land at all risks. Leave the instruments, everything. Both men seized the valve line and hung on for dear life, and with such energy that they not only opened the valve, but also tore a large rent in the surrounding silk. The balloon descended almost in a straight line, and the car was dashed to the earth with a shock that shattered the instruments. But the aeronauts' lives were saved. A few seconds more, and the balloon would have struck the sea. 
Some idea of the speed of the fall may be formed from the fact that 10,000 feet were passed in four minutes. Two years later, Coxwell had a similar experience in an ascent from Belfast. On this occasion, he took up with him a number of passengers. Seeing that the balloon was approaching the sea, they became alarmed, and one of their number seized the valve line with such violence that it broke. The danger was now real, so Coxwell gave the order for all to leave the car together the moment its downward tendency brought it within a safe anchoring distance of the ground. His commands were obeyed, as he thought, by everyone. Two persons were, however, left behind, and the lightened balloon bounded upward for some distance. Fortunately, it came within reach again, and they were got out. The balloon again got free, and was afterwards picked up on the shore of Lurgan Bay, anchored within a few paces of the sea. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seven Miles High The highest ascent on record was accomplished on the 5th of September 1862 by Mr. Coxwell, the hero of the previous chapter, accompanied by the well known scientist. Mr. T. Glacier. This was the most important of the eight scientific ascents made on behalf of the British Association at this time. The fittings of the car were arranged with the utmost care. Glacier had a specially prepared table fixed in the basket, on and attached to which were about 30 different instruments, so placed that each could be easily consulted. Indeed, nothing was left undone that was likely to ensure the success of the voyage and the accuracy of the observations. Accordingly, on the day named, the balloon made a rapid ascent from Wolverhampton, shortly after one o'clock. All went well and in about half an hour they had reached a height of four miles. Still the balloon ascended. All this time Glacier was fully occupied with his observations, but suddenly he became conscious of a dimness of sight, and soon could not read any of the fine divisions of his instruments. They were now over five miles high. Alarming as was this experience, it was as nothing to what followed. Wishing to enter an observation in his notebook, Glacier found that his right arm was powerless. A moment before, it had been possessed of full vigour. He tried his left arm. It also was useless. He struggled and shook his body, but he could not move his arms. He looked at the barometer, and whilst doing so, his head fell back, resting on the edge of the car. In this position, he says, I dimly saw Mr. Coxwell and tried to speak, but could not. In an instant, intense darkness overcame me but I was still conscious, with as active a brain as at the present moment while writing this. Then he became insensible. At the moment Glacier was seized with partial blindness, the valve line became entangled, and Coxwell had to leave the car and go up into the ring to readjust it. The task was not easy. 
The cold was intense, and hoarfrost had gathered all round the neck of the balloon. When at length matters were put right, and the aeronaut prepared to return to the car, he found his hands were frozen. He had therefore to place his arms in the ring and drop down. Glacier was by this time lying insensible in the bottom of the car. The looseness of his attitude and the calm expression on his features alarmed Coxwell, and he attempted to move forward to see if his companion was still alive. But he too was powerless. Unconsciousness was rapidly overtaking him. He knew that unless a descent was made, and that speedily, they could not reach land alive. His hands were powerless, but with the energy of determination, he seized the valve line in his teeth and dipped his head till the balloon began to descend. He next turned his attention to his companion the first words of which Glacier became conscious were temperature and observation, but he could neither see, speak, or move. Gradually his faculties returned, and he sat up and looked round like a man who had just awakened from sleep. I have been insensible, he said. You have, replied Coxwell and I too very nearly. He then resumed his former position, and with notebook and pencil in hand, continued his observations as if nothing had happened. One cannot but admire his heroic sense of duty. Even in this critical moment, he gave no thought to self his whole mind being devoted to the obtaining of observations that would be of value to science. Slowly the balloon descended, and at last came to the earth seven miles from Ludlow. No conveyance could be obtained, and a long compulsory walk to that town finished the day. Neither of the aeronauts experienced any bad effects from their perilous adventure. From careful observation and calculation, Glacier estimated that they had reached the extraordinary height of 37,000 feet, or upwards of seven miles, and that too in little more than an hour. The escape of Glacier and Coxwell from death at that tremendous elevation, marvellous as it was considered at the time, is rendered more remarkable by the fate which befell three Frenchmen who attempted a similar ascent twelve years later. This is one of the saddest episodes in the history of ballooning. The French Society of Aerial Navigation organised an ascent for the purpose of testing the restorative powers of oxygen when breathed instead of ordinary air in a rarefied atmosphere. Accordingly, a new and large balloon named the Zenith was built and inflated at La Villette Gasworks in Paris. On a bright spring day in April 1874, the ascent was made. In the car were three gentlemen, Monsieur Civel, captain of the balloon, and two scientists, Croce Spinelli and Gaston Tissandia. The latter had joined the expedition for the purpose of analysing the dust of the air and had brought with him a large reservoir of petroleum oil, which was fastened to the car by cords, so that it might be easily cut away if its great weight should imperil the safety of the balloon. All went well till they had reached an elevation of about 23,000 feet, 
when they experienced some difficulty in breathing. This was, however, soon remedied by inhaling the oxygen they had brought with them. They felt greatly invigorated, and after a brief discussion, it was decided to attempt an even greater altitude. A quantity of ballast was thrown over, and the zenith shot upward. Soon afterwards, Tisandia fainted and remained unconscious for upwards of an hour, till he was awakened by one of his companions, who warned him that the balloon was descending. In a mechanical sort of way, like one in a dream, Tisandia threw over some ballast. Hardly had he done so than he sank back exhausted and fell asleep. A momentary panic seems at this point to have prostrated the wits of his companions, who madly cut away the reservoir, which weighed about 80 pounds. Thus lightened, the balloon rushed upwards at a fearful speed, and as it travelled, unconsciousness overcame those in the car. An hour later, Tisandia again roused himself. The zenith was descending rapidly, and there was no more ballast left to break the force of the terrific plunge. Turning to his companions for help, a horrible sight met his gaze. They were lying in the bottom of the car, black in the face and with blood oozing from their mouths. They had been suffocated and were both dead. The rapidity with which the balloon dropped through space gave no time for thought and the fate which had befallen his friends numbed his action. Soon he would be like them, dead, dashed to pieces. It was a terrible position, but with the resource which often comes to men in moments of the direst peril, Tisandia saw a way of escape and prepared to avail himself of it. With the utmost coolness, he cut away the grapnel rope just as the car was about to strike the ground. The balloon rose for a moment and was swept along by the force of the wind. He tore open the silk to check its mad flight. It was at last caught in a hedge at Siron, a commune of Endre, a hundred and ninety miles from Paris. The survivor was found by some people in the neighbourhood, who nursed him with every care till he was sufficiently recovered to return home. There are no records of the height that was reached on this occasion, but it must have been very great. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Terrible Experience The Jayon was the name appropriately given to an immense balloon which was constructed in Paris in the year 1863. It was made entirely of silk and was upwards of a hundred and twenty feet in height. Underneath the globe was a smaller balloon called the compensator, which was intended to prevent loss of gas during the voyage. The car was perhaps the most wonderful part of this gigantic machine. In shape, it was not unlike a small cottage. It had two stories. 13 feet long by 8 feet high, with berths like a ship, and plentifully stocked with provisions. The first ascent took place in Paris on the 4th of October, 1863, under the management of an aeronaut named Monsieur Nadar. The excursions of the Géon made a great commotion. 
They were indeed almost as sensational as the original Montgolfier and Charles ascents, and an immense crowd assembled to witness the departure of the balloon with its crew of 13 persons, each of whom carried a passport in nearly all the languages of Europe. The ascent was slow and gradual at first, as if the giant machine was feeling its way to the clouds. Then it rapidly descended, and it was not till several bags of ballast had been thrown out that the Géon took its flight to the upper air amid the cheers of the spectators. Paris was passed over at the height of about 600 feet, but the voyage for which the most elaborate preparations had been made, and which was to bring about a new order of things in the science of ballooning, ended at Meaux, distant about 30 miles from Paris. About a fortnight later, a second attempt was made to prove the Géon worthy of the expectations to which its construction had given rise. On this occasion, the balloon was carried in a northeasterly direction and was last seen by the inhabitants of Paris making for the Belgian frontier. Soon afterwards, the sun set in purple majesty and the aeronauts from the roof of their osier house looked down in admiration through the clear night air on the wonderful panorama that was unfolded to their view. Over cities, fires, forges, tall chimneys and coal mines, they were carried in safety. Occasionally there came loud shouting from below as the balloon became clearly visible. Once, in passing over a small town, someone in the excitement of the moment fired a gun, and for a while the aeronauts were spellbound with terror, not knowing if the gun was loaded or if the ball might pierce the globe. But nothing of the kind happened. Brilliant gaslit Brussels was quickly left behind, and then the balloon entered a region of silence and darkness. So on through the night the voyage was continued. All was silent in and around the car, save when Nadar woke the echoes of the slumbering earth with titanic shouts from a speaking trumpet worthy of his balloon. At dawn, all was going well, and the aeronauts had a magnificent view of the sunrise. Suddenly, as with a burst of joy, a flash of light darts through the azure vault. It is the signal, re-echoed from the most distant horizons, of the ushering in of day in all its splendours. But the voyage, so fortunately begun and so successful up to this point, was nearing a tragic termination. Away on the edge of the horizon, a white streak, as of fog, was seen, which Nadar at once declared was the sea. A sudden and unaccountable panic took possession of the voyagers, in spite of the reassuring words of their captain that there was no danger. Someone pulled open the valve. What followed was not a descent, but a fall. Down went the balloon like a stone. There was no time to speak, and no one had sufficient presence of mind to act in this awful, sudden emergency. The ground was within thirty yards of them, and appeared to be rushing to meet them with lightning rapidity. There were still twenty sacks of ballast in the car, sufficient, had they been thrown overboard, to arrest this headlong plunge to earth, and give the aeronauts time to choose a suitable landing place. But they remained undisturbed, while each and all sought the only possible safety in clinging to the ropes of the balloon. 
Fortunately, the wind blew with such terrific violence near the ground that their fall was broken, and instead of crashing to the earth, the balloon was carried along a short distance. Hold on, hold on, was the cry, as with a thundering shock the car collided with a mound. Many were forced to let go their hold and were thrown on their heads. The balloon rebounded with an immense spring. The platform of the car was now a scene of confusion and fear, as everyone rushed to his place again and held on with the determined grip of despair. Houses and fields flew past with a rapidity which almost rendered them unnoticeable. Another shock caused the Jayon to rock and tremble. The rope of the anchor, which had been thrown out in the vain hope of arresting their progress, was snapped by the force of the collision as if it had been made of pack thread. Onward they flew with redoubled speed before the fury of an ever increasing gale. The shocks were now so frequent that it was impossible to count them, and at each shock the car rebounded like an India rubber ball, sometimes to a height of fifty feet. The terror-stricken crew had crowded by this time to one side of the car, and as this happened to be the side which struck the ground, their sufferings and dangers were increased tenfold. By the least negligence or slip, or by the loss of presence of mind for one moment, we should have been thrown out and dashed to atoms. Every collision tries our muscles and strains our wrists or our shoulders, and every rebound dashes us one against the other, constituting each individual a tormentor and victim at the same time. Our flight is so rapid that we can only distinguish an occasional glimpse of anything. What a dizzy whirl! What a succession of breathless shocks! Far in the distance we distinguish an isolated tree. We approach it like lightning, and we break it as if it were a straw. Two terrified horses, with manes and tails erect, endeavour to fly from us, but we consume distances and leave them behind immediately. But a still greater danger was at hand. The path of their flight was next crossed by a railway embankment, along which a train was slowly travelling. Benumbed with fear, the aeronauts clung to their posts awaiting the catastrophe. They knew well enough that one of two things must happen. Either they would be crushed by the locomotive, or the balloon would, in its hurricane speed, overturn the train. A few yards more and all will be decided. So they thought but they had reckoned without the engine driver. He, too, comprehended the danger, and, after quickly bringing the train to a standstill, backed just in time to allow the flying monster to sweep past. "'Look out for the wires!' cried the man, and those in the car instantly lowered their heads in obedience to the well-timed warning. No one was hurt, but several of the ropes were cut. Still the Jayon kept on her headlong course, trailing after her, like the tail of a comet, the telegraph wires and the poles by which they had lately been supported. At length, the car became entangled in a wood near Retham in Hanover. The adventurers were thrown out, and several of them had their limbs broken. The blind King of Hanover treated the unfortunate aeronauts with great hospitality, and entertained them till they had sufficiently recovered to return to Paris. End of chapter 10
Chapter 11 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twixt Sea and Sky To Jules Durnoff belongs the proud distinction of having been the first man to show the way out of Paris in a balloon, when the French capital was besieged by the Germans in 1870. As a French writer says, an aeronautical courteous was wanted, who would throw himself head foremost into the gulf of the clouds, and Durnoff did not hesitate to brave the fire of the Prussians with an old balloon leaking at every seam. He had been one of the crew of the Géon, and in that terrible trip, he had learned the lesson invaluable to aeronauts, never to despair, a lesson which in subsequent years stood him in good stead on more than one perilous occasion. With the means now at his disposal, he knew that his only hope of safety lay in the force with which he started, so he launched his balloon like a projectile which issues from a monster mortar. He carried with him a number of dispatches for the authorities at Tours, then the seat of government. His ascent did not escape the eyes of the watchful Prussians, who greeted his appearance over their lines with a rolling fire of musketry, and followed the course of the balloon in hot pursuit, expecting that it would be brought down. It was no light task to keep the leaky globe afloat, and Durnoff's utmost skill and attention were called into action. But in spite of this, he enlivened the terrible situation with a display truly Parisian. Having sacrificed a large quantity of ballast, and so risen above the range of the enemy's fire, he threw carte de visite down on the heads of the Prussians, who, infuriated at his escape, no less than his contemptuous treatment of them, directed a salvo of artillery against the vanishing balloon. Fortunately, the daring aeronaut was out of range, and he eventually landed in safety 19 miles away. Towards the end of July 1873, Durnoff made one of the most sensational ascents ever accomplished. He had arranged to start from Calais, with the intention of making the passage of the Channel from France to England. His wife was to accompany him. When everything was in readiness, the weather was unfavourable, and the authorities refused to sanction his departure. The mayor, however, had not the courage of his convictions, and delayed making the decision of the council known to the people. They naturally thought that the blame rested with Durnoff, and in their disappointment, several persons loudly accused the aeronaut of being afraid. The man who had opened the aerial route from Paris needed not to pay any heed to these grumblings, but at once his courage was on fire, and, obtaining possession of the balloon, he set out before the authorities had time to prevent him, taking his wife with him. Night came, terribly dark and stormy, as the adventurous voyagers vanished over the sea. When the story of the ascent became known throughout Europe, it was received with mingled feelings of horror and admiration. Horror that so brave a man should have been driven to so desperate a deed admiration for the heroic rashness which prompted him to risk two lives that the charge of fear and failure might never appear against his name. No less heroic is the trustful simplicity of his wife, who, 
in the face of the peril, calmly accompanied her husband, confident of his coolness and energy. Three days passed, during which the utmost anxiety prevailed. All hoped, but none expected, ever to hear of the adventurous couple again. At length, the miraculous news was flashed along the wire that Durnoff and his wife were safe. Their escape was indeed marvellous. When they ascended, they were carried by the wind out across the North Sea. Towards nightfall, Durnoff attempted to attract the attention of some passing vessels, but without success. The violence of the wind was by this time greatly increased, and the position of the aeronauts became more and more hazardous. The balloon had a strong downward tendency, and there seemed to them no escape from a watery grave. At length, the Great Charter, a fishing smack from Grimsby, hove in sight. Durnoff signalled frantically for help, and the Englishmen at once shaped the course of their boat towards the balloon. What happened after this cannot be better described than in the aeronaut's own words. The sea was very rough indeed. I opened the valve and descended until the ropes were trailing in the water, and in an instant we were past the vessel. The crew of the smack, however, launched their boat, and two men rowed it towards us. It was then six o'clock, and, seeing the goodwill of the fishermen to come to help us, I resolved to stop the speed of the balloon by springing the valve until the car filled with water, and thus give more resistance to the speed of the balloon. When I turned round, however, I could not see the vessel. From time to time, tremendous waves broke over the balloon, covering us with water. We were drenched to the skin, and I was in constant fear lest the balloon should burst, in which case we should have assuredly been lost. At seven o'clock we again sighted the smack on the horizon, and saw that she was pursuing us and by degrees we noticed that she came closer to us. The cold was most intense, and our limbs were gradually becoming powerless. Our strength failed fast, and the hope of being overtaken by the smack alone gave our arms nerve to hold on. My wife's limbs were benumbed, and at each succeeding jerk of the balloon she became weaker and weaker, and I had to support her entire weight in my arms. The smack continued to approach us, and was now only about six hundred yards off. I pointed this out to my wife, and it renewed her courage. I raised myself on the ropes and saluted our rescuers. They saw us and launched their boat, manned by William Oxley and James Bascom, the master and mate of the smack. They came nearer to the car and took hold of the rope. Then followed a scene of which every Briton may well feel proud, rich as our country is in memories of heroic deeds of life-saving. The gallant Grimsby fishers seized hold of a rope thus fixing themselves to the balloon, which dragged them through the water at a furious pace. Their boat was nearly sinking, says Durnoff, on account of the strong jerks of the balloon, but they did not lose courage, and, taking hold of my wife's hand, who was like a corpse, dragged her as best they could into their boat. I was dashed against the side, and I let myself fall into it, where I lay on the floor as helpless as my wife. The men let go the ropes of the car, 
and the balloon rushed off with a mighty speed towards Norway. The exhausted aeronaut and his unconscious wife were taken on board the smack and conveyed to Grimsby in safety. They were received in London with the greatest enthusiasm, and a benefit fete was organised at the Crystal Palace, in which they took part, so little had their perilous adventure affected their courage. When they returned to France, the people of Calais collected a handsome sum of money, which Durnoff spent in the construction of a large balloon, to which he gave the name of Ville de Calais, in honour of the town. In this balloon, Durnoff ascended at Cherbourg on the 21st of August, 1876. He had profited greatly by his former experience, and to prevent accident, he ordered four steamers to cruise about in the offing. He also attached large cork floats to the car, and a huge cone hung suspended from a long rope, so that, should he come down in the water, the drifting would not be attended by the same dangers as in the North Sea. The wind was in a northeasterly direction, and carried the balloon rapidly towards the strait. Hoping to reach a current which would bear him to land again, Durnoff threw out quantities of ballast and rose to an elevation of 14,000 feet. The breeze was still seaward, so he determined to make a descent in the water. His appliances worked admirably. When the Ville de Calais approached the waves, Durnoff threw out the cone, which instantly diminished the speed, so that the crew of the steamer, which came up in a few minutes, had no difficulty in securing the balloon and towing it into port. Strange to say, a repetition of this experiment on the following day ended in the total wreck of the Ville de Calais. A few years ago, a French aeronaut named Gaston Bessanson made an ascent from Havre, accompanied by two friends, in a balloon called the Jupiter. It was struck almost at once by a gale which carried it straight over the broadest part of the channel. They disappeared from view, and for a week nothing was heard of them, and they were given up for lost. They were, however, by what seems a special providence, saved, and the story of their adventure rivals the perils endured by Durnoff and his wife. When Bessanson saw what course the balloon was taking, he opened the valve. When it neared the surface, he threw out a weight which he hoped would serve as a floating anchor, and by the aid of which, by paying out or taking in rope, the Jupiter might be kept at a safe distance from the waves. This plan was excellent, and had often been successful, but on this occasion the gale was so strong and the plunging of the airship so violent that the stout rope snapped like thread, and the anchor was lost. Like a restive steed, the balloon plunged hither and thither, nearly upsetting the car at each bound, while the aeronauts clung in silent terror to the edge in momentary expectation of being thrown out. They gave up all thought of managing their craft, and it quickly sank to the water. Everything in the car was at once cast overboard, but without success. Then they divested themselves of the greater part of their clothing, and the balloon slowly rose. But the respite was brief, and in the meantime their sufferings from cold were extreme. The aeronauts heard the voices of fishermen in their boats and shouted to attract their attention. 
but in vain. They were hurried out of hearing, and an awful silence, broken only by the noise of the waves, settled upon them. Throughout the long dreary night, they were buffeted about. They were almost dead with cold, exposure and fatigue. They abandoned all hope and gave themselves up for lost. Day dawned. Suddenly they saw a vessel before them. They shouted and made what signals they could. Eagerly they waited, and in a few minutes they saw with unspeakable joy a boat put off from the steamer. No ordinary skill and bravery were required to pilot the boat in such a sea, and the utmost caution was required in getting alongside the tossing balloon. At the risk of their lives, the sailors seized a rope and dragged the Frenchman out of the very jaws of death. The aeronauts were taken on board the steamer, where they received every possible kindness and attention. When they had sufficiently recovered, they learned that the ship was the Germania, manned by German sailors. They had been rescued by their national enemies. The balloon afterwards descended in England, having made a voyage to the clouds, where the car had become weighted with snow and ice. End of chapter 11「Drops from Cloudland」Stanley Spencer, the head of the well-known firm of balloon makers, is an aeronaut of great daring and experience. He has made altogether 2,000 balloon ascents and nearly a thousand parachute descents. Nor have his adventures been confined to England. He has braved the dangers of the air in the Cape, America, France, and other continental countries. He carries on his wrist an ugly scar, which he received many years ago in Havana under rather curious circumstances. He was to make a parachute descent from a hot air balloon. Such a machine has neither car, ballast, nor netting, and had therefore to be held down by a small army of men till everything was ready for the start. The place from which the ascent had to be made was badly chosen, being shut in by houses and surrounded with telegraph wires. Hardly had Spencer started than a boisterous wind caught the balloon and bore it down on one of the poles used in hoisting, which ripped a great hole in the side. Thinking, however, that he had still time to reach the necessary elevation before the hot air was expended, he continued on his way. About 50 feet from the ground, he was swept against the telegraph wires, one of which caught his wrist, inflicting the scar of which we have spoken, while others broke across his chest. He held on like grim death, and after a few more tugs, he got free and ascended with a long piece of wire hanging to the balloon. Much precious time had meanwhile been lost, and the hot air had escaped in such quantities that it was impossible for him to reach the height necessary for a safe descent by parachute. The wound in his wrist too bled freely, and he began to feel faint. He clung to the balloon, and after a time it took a downward course landing him eventually in the backyard of a house among a brood of chickens. When he was found, he was so overcome with weakness that he could hardly speak. 
The authorities were, of course, summoned, and Spencer was carried to the military hospital where his wrist was sewn up. When he came out of the hospital, a great crowd of Spaniards was waiting to receive him, in total ignorance that an accident had happened, or that a parachute descent had taken place. So great was their admiration for what they regarded as a feat of unparalleled daring that they took the horses out of his carriage and dragged him through the streets in triumph till the police came to the rescue of the bewildered aeronaut. There is nothing of which an aeronaut has a greater dread than to be carried out to sea. But Spencer has encountered this adventure on several occasions. On one occasion, he ascended from Prince Edward Island on a beautiful calm day. All went well till he reached an elevation of 3,000 feet, when the wind shifted and carried him out over the water. Fortunately, he had taken the precaution of putting on a life belt, so that when he left the car with his parachute, he felt little apprehension. Down he went into the water like a stone. When he came to the surface, his first thought was for his parachute. It was floating near, like a huge jellyfish. He at once seized it, determined to save it if possible. Those on shore lost no time in sending a boat to his aid, but nearly an hour elapsed before it reached him. During this time, he was frequently under water, for as the parachute got wet, it dragged him down, and it was only by the greatest exertion that he was able to keep himself and his jellyfish afloat. A few years ago, Spencer had another salt water experience. This time he ascended from Sunderland. The day was bright and calm, in fact, an ideal day for an aerial trip. The balloon rose quickly to an elevation of 5,000 feet, the utmost height from which a safe descent can be made by parachute. Just as he was preparing to cast loose, a strong upper current swept the balloon seawards. Quickly he threw out every ounce of ballast in the hope of changing his direction and in a few minutes the balloon mounted 1,500 feet. Looking over the edge of the car, Spencer saw the sea below him shining in the strong sunlight like a silver mirror. From the distance it was impossible for him to choose his landing place or to know whether or not he would alight in the water. The chances look decidedly in favour of my taking an involuntary bath, he said afterwards, but I decided to let go. As it happened, I landed on the beach within a few yards of the surf and escaped with nothing more serious than a spray shower bath. On another occasion, at Halifax, Nova Scotia, he was less fortunate. On falling into the sea, his limbs became entangled in the cords of the parachute, so that he was practically powerless to keep afloat. Just when he was giving up all hope, he was seen and rescued by a passing fishing smack. At Bristol in the autumn of 1894, Spencer had his most exciting adventure, and one from which it is a marvel he escaped with his life. The day was altogether unsuitable for the aeronaut. Heavy rain fell, and the wind was boisterous, with now and then a heavy squall. Being unwilling to disappoint those who had come to see him, he determined to risk an ascent. When only a few hundred feet from the ground, 
the balloon was struck by a heavy squall, and before he really knew what had happened, he found himself falling rapidly. He was too near the ground to make use of the parachute, so there was no way of escape. For one moment, he saw a sea of white upturned faces apparently rushing towards him. The next, he went crashing through the roof of a house and through the ceiling of a room in which two old ladies were sitting. Here, his descent stopped. He was picked up unconscious and carried to a hospital. Incredible as it may seem, no bones were broken, and beyond a few cuts and bruises, he was none the worse. Three days later, he ascended under more favourable conditions and accomplished the descent in safety. An exciting scene took place at a forester's fete near Cardiff early in 1890. Among the attractions was a parachute descent by a lady aeronaut named Ada MacDonald. A hot air balloon was used for the ascent, and the apparatus used was complicated and clumsy. She had a thick strap round her waist, and to it were attached the thin white cords of the parachute, which was, in its turn, attached to the bottom of the balloon. When all was ready, the order to let go was given, and the balloon shot upwards. But the men, who were holding the small wicker chair in which the girl sat, let go too soon. The consequence was that the cordage between the chair and the parachute straightened with a violent jerk, and to the horror of the spectators, the aeronaut was thrown out of the chair and hung suspended by the belt. The balloon ascended with great velocity, and all the while the girl was seen helplessly struggling in the air, entangled among the cords of the parachute. At a height of about 3,000 feet, the parachute passed under her, and almost at the same moment she broke loose from the balloon. For a few seconds her descent was headlong, and then, as if by a miracle, the parachute opened and stayed her fall. Coming down gracefully, she landed in a field, and, beyond the nervous shock, none the worse for her startling adventure. An aeronaut named Higgins, who came forward as the rival of Baldwin, the daring American parachutist, had a singular experience on one of his trips from Croydon on the 12th of April, 1890. The balloon had no car, and the aeronaut sat on a small trapeze suspended from the netting. On reaching a height of 4,000 feet, the balloon got into a strong current and twisted right round. The wind then caught the parachute, causing the wooden ring to grip him tightly under the arms. While he was trying to put matters right again, the test cord broke and the parachute hung down below him fully inflated. The pressure on his limbs was so great that he had the utmost difficulty in retaining his seat and a descent was impossible. He therefore opened his penknife with his teeth and cut the cords of the parachute. This caused the balloon to shoot 6,000 feet higher, and on reaching that altitude, he was encountered by another current, which brought with it sleet and snow. He never for a moment lost his self-possession, and during his strange voyage was able to take note of the merest detail of his surroundings. The storm lasted for about ten minutes, and during that time, Higgins was in total darkness, and the only sound which reached his ears was the rumbling of trains. 
When he passed through this snow cloud, the sun was shining brightly. Below him, as far as the eye could reach, he saw what appeared to be snow-clad mountains. So clear was the atmosphere that he could see a distance of 40 miles and was able to discern the sun glistening on the sea at Brighton. Presently the air became very keen and on his moustache long icicles formed which he no sooner rubbed off than others took their places. For a few minutes he was quite deaf he thought he was nearing Hastings or Brighton, for the salt smell of the sea reached him. The balloon then took a downward course, and to accelerate the descent, he seized the guy rope and pulled the balloon partly over on one side to allow some gas to escape by the mouth. Sitting on his trapeze, Higgins kept an eager watch for the earth. At length, he saw the welcome sight of some ploughed fields. The balloon travelled very rapidly in a southerly direction for about six miles, and then slowly descended. When he was about 2,000 feet from the earth, he let himself hang by one arm from his trapeze rope, as if he were using his parachute. His feet touched the ground. The balloon, which was in front of him, dragged him for several yards and then rebounded sixty feet into the air between two trees. His perilous position was seen by some labourers who ran to his assistance, and when he came to earth the second time, they seized the balloon and held it till the aeronaut let out the gas. He landed on a farm at Penshurst, near Tunbridge, with hands, feet, and legs benumbed, but highly pleased with his remarkable escapade. At the festival of the London Sunday School Choir, which was held at the Crystal Palace in 1892, one of the chief features of the entertainment was a balloon ascent by Captain Dale, a well-known and skilful aeronaut. About six o'clock on the evening of the 29th of June, the balloon was inflated and the captain entered the car, accompanied by three companions. The order to let go was given and the balloon rose quickly travelling with the wind in a southerly direction. In a few minutes, an altitude of 600 feet had been reached. The crowds of spectators in the grounds were eagerly following the course of the balloon, when all in an instant they were horrified to see it collapse. A large rent appeared in the side, through which the gas escaped almost in volume. The balloon dropped like a stone. The aeronauts could be distinctly seen struggling against the fearful fate which awaited them. Ballast, bags, ropes, everything indeed which was likely to lighten the car was thrown out, madly, vainly. Some idea of their desperation may be formed from the fact that they wrenched the buttons from their clothing in their frantic endeavours to lessen the speed of their descent. These were afterwards found among the debris. Down came the balloon and landed with a sickening thud on the grass near the lower lake. Willing helpers were quickly on the scene. Everyone expected to find that the four occupants of the car had been dashed to pieces. All were alive, but fearfully injured. Captain Dale only lived a few minutes. The others were taken to the hospital. Nine days later, another death was added. That of Cecil Shadbolt, 
one of the secretaries of the Western Kent Sunday School Union. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tragic Adventures. Notwithstanding the host of dangers which attend the aerial traveller from the moment he enters the car till the time he leaves it, the number of casualties in the navigation of the air has been less in proportion than in the navigation of the sea. Taking 1,500 aeronauts and 10,000 ascents, only about 15 lives have been lost. There are, however, many tragic adventures on record. In the early part of the century, an Englishman named Knight made a number of successful ascents from Bombay. One day, when the wind was blowing strongly from the land, an Indian prince came forward and offered him a large sum of money if he would make an ascent. Knight looked seaward, and without hesitation accepted the offer, for on the horizon he saw a numerous fleet of native boats. He ascended and was driven out to sea. On nearing the boats, he opened the valve and called to the men to come to his assistance. But when the Indians saw the monstrous apparition descending from the skies, they were filled with terror and made all sail to get beyond the reach of the superhuman monster. Left to his fate, the aeronaut was soon engulfed in the waves. Madame Blanchard, the wife of the pioneer voyager across the channel, was as famous an aeronaut as her husband. She was a veritable queen of the air, and used to ascend in a car so small and fragile that it was likened to a child's cradle. On the 7th of July, 1819, she made an illuminated ascent from the Tivoli Gardens. When at a great height, a quantity of escaping gas caught light from the fireworks, and in an instant the balloon was in flames. The people below, seeing the blaze, and ignorant of what had happened, rent the air with shouts of, Brava! Vive Madame Blanchard! thinking that they were witnessing a new sensation. Their shouts reached the ears of the aeronaut, who, with splendid nerve, was trying might and main to extinguish the fire. But the flames had obtained the mastery. The balloon descended, and she threw out her ballast to moderate her fall. Driven back by the increase of pressure, the gas re-entered the balloon and was extinguished she would yet be saved. But the pitiless wind blew her on to the roof of a house. At the moment of the shock, she was heard to cry, A moi, meaning help. These were her last words. In gliding along the roof, the car caught in a piece of iron and was overturned. The brave lady was taken unawares, and before she could seize hold of a rope, she was precipitated to the street below, where she breathed her last. The mistake of some French peasants led to the death of Lieutenant Gale in 1850. He made an equestrian ascent from Bordeaux, and descended in safety but he failed to make the peasants who came to his assistance understand what he wanted them to do, and as soon as the horse was detached, the balloon flew upwards at a great speed. On the following day it was found, caught in the branches of a tree, but it was not till a week later 
that the horrible fate of the aeronaut was ascertained. He was found in a wood, his body having become the prey of wolves. In 1865, a young aeronaut named Chambers fell a victim to inexperience and want of care. He ascended from Nottingham, and neglected to open the upper valve to allow the gas to escape, which consequently forced its way out by the neck. Feeling that he was being overcome by the fumes, Chambers twisted the valve line round his wrist and pulled. Then he became unconscious. The balloon dropped to the earth with a crash, and the unfortunate aeronaut was picked up dead. Captain Donaldson, an American aeronaut, made an ascent from Chicago in August 1875. The wind was so violent that at first it was found impossible to inflate the balloon. So determined was he, however, that he caused a row of lofty poles to be erected, across which stout sheets were stretched to break the force of the gale. When at length the globe was filled, two journalists entered the car, and the order was given to let go. The balloon rose, but was immediately dashed to the ground. One of the passengers profited by this accident to drop from the car and leave his companions to their fate. Relieved of his weight, the balloon disappeared like an arrow in the direction of Lake Michigan. A few hours later, the captain of a small Swedish schooner bound for Chicago saw the balloon approaching the water and made all sail to the rescue. So fierce was the hurricane that the little vessel was soon alongside. The crew were about to lay hold of the netting and drag Donaldson and his companion aboard, when, with a supernatural suddenness, the balloon bounded from them and was quickly lost to view. Three weeks later, the bodies of the luckless adventurers were cast ashore by the waves. Another aerial traveller who lost his life under similar circumstances was Walter Powell, who started from Bath on the 10th of December 1881, accompanied by two friends. When they had drifted to a point near Bridport in Dorset, they attempted to descend within half a mile of the sea. The balloon struck the ground with such violence that his two companions were thrown out of the car, and before he could provide for his own safety, he was carried out to sea. A number of vessels went in pursuit, but returned without having obtained a sight of the balloon. The coasts of France and Spain were carefully searched, but no trace was ever found of the missing balloon or its occupant. Doubtless, he was drowned in the depths of the channel. In June 1885, an aeronaut named Williams was killed at Charleston, West Virginia, under circumstances which ordinary courage and presence of mind could easily have prevented. He was in the car preparing to ascend when the balloon swayed against a furnace and was set on fire. The men who were holding the ropes became panic-stricken and fled. Williams had no chance of escape and sat in the car calmly awaiting death. The burning balloon rose a thousand feet into the air and then collapsed. A honeymoon trip in the Alps had recently a disastrous ending. Captain Charbonnet an aeronaut well known throughout Italy, presented his bride with a new balloon as a wedding gift, and in September 1893, the couple started from Turin and descended at Piobese, 
where they were received by the inhabitants with great enthusiasm. On the following day, accompanied by a friend named Ponta, they made a fresh ascent with the intention of passing the Alps and descending on French territory. All went well till they neared the Caramella Peaks, when the balloon was caught in a hurricane and dashed with great violence against a glacier and made a total wreck. Strange to say, the travellers escaped with but trifling injuries. They spent the first night amid the snow and ice, obtaining what shelter they could under the remains of the balloon. When day dawned, they decided to attempt the descent of the mountain, although the weather was very misty and bitterly cold. Charbonnet led the way. The party had not proceeded far when he suddenly disappeared in a crevasse. The whole of the day the survivors wandered about, dreading lest every step should precipitate them into some unfathomable abyss. Towards evening, Ponta also fell and sustained serious injuries. Madame Charbonnet passed the second night in snow, watching by the side of her wounded companion, suffering terribly from cold and almost benumbed by grief. In the morning, Ponta was unable to move, so the brave lady set off alone to look for assistance. Again and again on that terrible journey, she was on the point of giving up in despair, and would gladly have welcomed the sleep which meant death. But the thought that another life depended on her energy nerved her to go forward. At length, in a state of complete exhaustion, she reached a mountaineer's hut, where she told her sad story. A number of men at once set out to the rescue, and carried Ponta down to the hut, where he quickly recovered from his injuries, and with the widowed bride returned to Turin. Captain Charbonnet's body was afterwards found, fearfully mangled. Monsieur Boiteau, one of the survivors of the ballooning fatality which took place in France in August 1896, gives a thrilling account of the ascent. He says, When we had risen 500 yards or so, we found ourselves in such thick clouds that we could distinguish nothing. Suddenly the balloon lay on one side, and the car leaped terribly. At the same time we were lashed by large hailstones and heavy rain. We were driven forward with bewildering speed. In our fright we threw over everything that our hands came across. The balloon sprang upward like an arrow, and soon passed through the clouds. We were under a clear sky, in the light of the setting sun. Gradually it grew colder and colder, and our wet clothes were frozen stiff. One of my companions fell fainting to the bottom of the car, and the other three of us were not much better off. We were all bleeding, for the hail had wounded us. As I looked, I saw a large black cloud moving from southwest to northeast, but we still rose. Then I saw nothing more. The blood streamed from my nose and ears. My hands were frozen, hard as a board. In a few minutes, we had risen to a height of nearly 5,000 yards. Then we began to sink, at first slowly, then rapidly. All at once we were again in complete darkness. We were in the midst of thunderclouds. Again, amid hail and rain, the wind drove the balloon on at a speed of 90 miles an hour. We were blinded by the hail and could scarcely breathe. 
but I did not lose hope of reaching the earth in safety. Presently the hail and rain began to be mixed with leaves and particles of earth. The car was violently shaken, and we fell against each other, and had to hold on to the ropes. Then we began to drag along the ground. The balloon suddenly rose. I let my rope go, and was dashed to the ground. Legrand, one of my companions, believed that I had voluntarily jumped out. He jumped out after me, and fell near me with a broken leg. Thus lightened of weight, the balloon rose more rapidly. Rushing through the treetops, it went on about six miles in the direction of Gretz. As it hung on the top of a tree, Foucard tried to land, caught a rope, but was thrown violently to the earth. A woman saw the balloon hanging in the trees and sent the people at her inn to the rescue. Foucard was found covered with mud and ice, his face all torn. He still breathed. When his head was raised, with the intention of giving him stimulants, he was seized with a convulsion and soon expired. As he was carried away, a weak voice was heard calling from the car for help. Two ladders were brought and tied together, and a gendarme climbed up to assist Crepillon. It took an hour to get him down. On reaching the ground, he fainted away. He was cold as ice, and only regained his senses after continued friction. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Which way does the wind blow? On the 5th of March 1882, Colonel Brine of the Royal Engineers, accompanied by Joseph Simmons, a professional aeronaut, set out from Canterbury to cross the English Channel. The most elaborate preparations were made to secure the success of the voyage. Meteorological observations were taken for several days, and it was arranged that a start should be made as soon as favourable reports were received. Early on the morning of the day named, a telegram was received stating that the wind at Dover and Cape Grenay was moderate from the north and likely to draw northwestwards. The conditions being so far favourable, it was decided to start at once. The gas was turned on at half past eight, and in two hours the balloon was fully inflated. But delays occurred, and it was not until half past eleven that the order to let go was given. The adventurers took with them a quantity of provisions and a life saving apparatus in case of accident in mid channel. Thousands of persons had assembled to witness the departure, and as the balloon rose slowly into the air, it was followed by loud cheers and hearty wishes for a successful voyage. Gradually the balloon reached an altitude of 1,600 feet, and the first three miles were traversed in six minutes. Shortly afterwards, however, the wind fell and the balloon rapidly descended over a field, so low indeed that the aeronauts heard some boys say, They are coming down in our field! The discharge of a quantity of ballast enabled them to rise 400 feet, but a few minutes later, a further sacrifice of ballast was found necessary to maintain this height. As they approached the sea, 
they noticed that the ships in the channel seemed as if they were sailing in air and not on the water. About half past twelve, when the balloon was between Folkestone and Dover, the sun described a perfect photograph of the balloon and car on a cloud which surrounded them. The effect was most remarkable and struck the voyagers with a feeling akin to awe. Readers of Jules Verne may remember his account of a similar optical illusion, the effect of a mirage, which created alarm in one of the occupants of the balloon, whose five weeks' journey among the clouds is so graphically told by the famous author. We could see our own reflections, says Simmons, and every detail, even to the untying of a knot, which I happened to be doing at the time. It was a perfect portrait. There was, at this moment, a lovely rainbow surrounding the car, not the balloon, about ten feet in diameter, and the beauty of the whole scene was strikingly grand. It was nearly one o'clock before the balloon passed over Shakespeare Cliff and floated out over the channel. It was a magnificent sight to see the slight surf on the coastline backed by a green sea, while over behind us stood the snowy chalk cliffs. Wishing to go higher, Ten pounds of ballast were thrown out, and the balloon reached an elevation of 1,900 feet. The current here was bearing directly for the coast of France, but the wind suddenly changed to a southeasterly direction. The aeronauts therefore descended a few hundred feet in the hope of finding a favourable breeze but in spite of all their manoeuvring, they were unable to effect their object, and swung about at the mercy of the gusts, which blew first southeast and then southwest. A slight mist came on, and the colonel gave it as his opinion that they were drifting rapidly towards the North Sea. Simmons, who saw that it was impossible to reach Calais, but did not want to admit failure without another attempt to reach a favouring current, did not reply. Soon, however, even he was forced to admit that the colonel was right. On taking a turn downward, the Calais mailboat was sighted, and from the direction of the smoke from the funnels, the aeronauts saw that a steady southwesterly breeze was blowing. This caused them to take prompt action, and they put on their cork jackets. There was not a moment to be lost if the packet was to pick them up, so the valve was opened and the balloon descended, striking the water with great violence about half-past two. They were at this time about 13 miles from Dover and eight from Calais. The following account by Captain Jutelet of the mail steamer graphically describes what happened. He says, As we were on our voyage from Calais to Dover, we saw the balloon bearing north-northwest of us. The balloon was about 500 yards up, and we hoisted our flags to salute the aeronauts. We cheered them several times as we passed under them. Immediately after this, we saw them drop something, but I did not know what it was then. I afterwards learned that it was an anchor, and was intended as a signal to us to stop. After we had passed the balloon some little distance, I saw it dropping, and I then bethought myself that they wanted our assistance. I told the men to get ready one of the lifeboats. I also altered the course and went back after the balloon, 
which had by this time struck the water. We were about twelve minutes before we overtook them, as the balloon was dragging the car through the water at a rate of about two miles an hour. When we got alongside, I called out, Do you want any assistance? Lower your boat and pick us up, shouted Simmons in reply. At this time the balloon was quite upright and had not lost a great quantity of gas. Simmons was very nervous lest our paddle wheel should come in contact with the car, so I lowered a boat and picked up the two aeronauts, at the same time dragging the balloon on board the vessel at the bow. I had 68 passengers on board, and I found it necessary to take great precautions with the balloon, on account of the large quantity of gas it contained. Simmons was afraid of anyone going near it in case they should be choked. I was afraid lest a spark might send us all to the bottom. I altered our course in the hope of driving the gas out, but that did no good, and it was not until I made two slits in the silk and so allowed the gas to escape that we were able to continue the passage. The captain also said that when the aeronauts were rescued, they were drifting rapidly towards the North Sea, and when the rescuing boat got alongside, they were sitting up to their knees in water. After a delay of 25 minutes, the voyage to Dover was resumed, at which port the adventurers were received with hearty cheers and congratulated on the plucky fight they had made against adverse circumstances. Delays are proverbially dangerous, and to the delay occasioned at the start, the failure of the attempt was in no small measure due. Was it possible to accomplish the voyage? was now the great question, or was the wind always blowing from the coast of France? End of chapter 14。Of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Burnaby's Travels in the Air Shortly after the unsuccessful attempt to cross the channel related in the previous chapter, Colonel Burnaby, the famous guardsman, determined to prove that such a voyage could be undertaken and accomplished. From Wright, the aeronaut of the Crystal Palace, he obtained a suitable balloon, which he had conveyed down to Dover, where he arranged with the manager of the gas works for the inflation. The news of the colonel's venture quickly became public, and he was inundated with offers from people in all parts of the country who wished to accompany him but their company was declined. Burnaby had firmly made up his mind to go alone, and he rightly judged that on this depended the success of his expedition. Even when he made this fact known, offers still came in, the aeronaut who had provided the balloon being the most pressing, but nothing could shake Burnaby's determination. At length all arrangements were completed, and the aeronaut arranged to start on the first suitable opportunity. He had not long to wait, for in a few days the wind blew strongly from the north. Quickly the balloon was inflated, and Burnaby stepped into the car. His outfit consisted merely of a few scientific instruments and a rug, while his provisions were limited to a few sandwiches and a bottle of mineral water. A few minutes before ten, the colonel gave the order to let go, 
and the balloon rose slowly in a seaward direction. At the very outset of his voyage, he was threatened with disaster. Right in his path was a tall chimney, towards which the balloon sailed with unerring precision. Ballast was precious, and he was unwilling to throw away a single ounce. He therefore waited until the last minute in the hope that the wind might carry him over or pass the obstruction. But there was no chance, so over went a small bag. The balloon rose, and the car just cleared the chimney. It was an ideal morning for the attempt. The wind was steady and the sky bright. As he sailed over the blue waters of the channel, the daring aeronaut had time to look back on the dear white cliffs of Dover, surmounted by the ancient castle, while at the foot lay the old-fashioned town and the busy port. Behind were green fields and hedges, which formed a striking background to a picture which he noted with the eye of a soldier and appreciated with that of an artist. For rather more than half the distance, the voyage was rapid and uneventful. The French coast now came in sight, and the aeronaut recognised that he was opposite Boulogne. Up to this time the sun had been bright, but the sky became cloudy and the balloon began to descend rapidly. The barometer registered 900 feet. A quantity of ballast was thrown out, but without checking the downward course. Bag followed bag in quick succession, and it was not until the car was within 400 feet of the waves that the balloon took an upward flight. The ascent was continued till a height of 1,500 feet had been reached. Then the aeronaut had time to look about him and take his bearings. To his surprise, the coast of France, which but a short time before had been clearly seen, was lost to view. While he had been busy with the ballast, the wind had veered round almost due east and swept him away from the shores which he had almost reached. In a short time, another change in the weather set in. The balloon hung motionless in the air. The sea was like a sheet of glass. In the water below him were two fishing boats, the crews of which offered to help him if he came down. He took no notice of their signs, beyond throwing down a copy of The Times, which fell straight into the water as if it had been a stone. For an hour the balloon remained in this position. Then it suddenly dropped, and, as before, was not checked till within 500 feet from the water. The fishermen came nearer and renewed their offer with no better result. So, after waiting for some time longer, they waved their caps and rowed away. Their disappearance was a great relief to Burnaby's mind. He had set out with the firm resolve that no action on his part should interfere with the success of the voyage, and he found the near presence of help a strong temptation to give up his self-imposed task and descend in safety. The balloon was still stationary. The day was wearing late, and unless he could find some means of reaching the other side in reasonable time, the gas would become exhausted, and his trip would end as previous attempts had done, in the water. He sat down to consider his position, and in defiance of one of the most stringent precepts of aeronautics, he lit a cigar. All the lower air currents he had found by experience were dead against him. 
his only chance was therefore to ascend, in the hope of encountering a stream which would carry him to France. There were five bags of ballast left, and these he judged to be sufficient to enable him to carry out his plan. Overboard went bag number one, and fell into the sea with a loud splash. The balloon rose to 3,000 feet. Another bag followed, but the sound of it striking the water did not reach the aeronaut's ears, so quickly was he ascending. At an altitude of 7,000 feet, a third bag was thrown out. This had the desired effect. Rapidly the balloon shot up to 10,000 feet and entered into a current which carried it swiftly towards France. The cold was now intense and a dense cloud enveloped the car for some time. When he emerged, however, Burnaby was overjoyed to see in front of him the harbour of Dieppe, he had crossed the channel. The object of his journey was accomplished, and he prepared to descend, when it occurred to him that he might possibly encounter an adverse current which would carry him out to sea again. He therefore continued his journey overland. So overjoyed was he at his success that he did not pay strict attention to the country over which he was travelling, with the consequence that, before he was aware of it, he was in a hilly district. He could not throw out ballast in time to avert a collision, and hung on with might and main to the car. There was a tremendous jerk, his rug and thermometer were thrown out, and the balloon rebounded a hundred feet into the air. Presently a ploughed field suggested a suitable landing place, and he let go the grapnel. The anchor held for a moment, and then broke loose. All the time the balloon jumped about in a most alarming fashion. Firmly grasping the hoop with one hand, and with the other tugging at the valve line, Burnaby waited the end. At last, the anchor caught in a bank and held fast. A crowd of people who had followed him quickly came to his assistance. Men and women alike were in a state of great excitement. Never before had a balloon descended in that part of Normandy, and they were highly gratified with the honour. They vied with one another in assisting Monsieur to pack up his balloon, and then the farmer on whose land he had alighted took him to his house, where he was most hospitably entertained. On the following morning, when Burnaby was leaving, his host took him to one side and made him promise that if he ever came again by balloon to that neighbourhood, he would be his guest, a promise which the colonel laughingly made. When the news of this successful attempt reached England, it created considerable surprise, for few had thought that Burnaby knew enough about ballooning to achieve such a result. To the majority, he was a dashing cavalryman and an intrepid traveller, fond of danger and adventure, and when he started, they thought he was only seeking a fresh excitement. But the colonel was really an experienced aeronaut and a member of the Aeronautical Society. His first balloon adventure, which happened in 1864, is typical of the man as we knew him. One evening he was strolling about one of the public gardens in London with a number of brother officers. It was in the days before the Montgolfier had been banished, and the French aeronaut Goddard 
had arranged to make an ascent on the following evening. As they were discussing it, another officer came up, accompanied by Goddard, who was introduced to Burnaby as the man who is going up tomorrow. That will be capital fun, replied Burnaby. Fun, do you call it? said the other. When a man runs the risk not only of getting his neck broken if anything goes wrong, but of being roasted to death as well. I should like to see you do it. This was a direct challenge, and Burnaby promptly accepted it. He spoke to Goddard, and in a few minutes everything was arranged. The aeronaut agreed to take him if he paid five pounds and promised to help in keeping up the fire. On the following evening, Burnaby hurried to the gardens, where he met numbers of his friends who had come to witness the performance. Leaving them to enjoy their laugh at his expense, he went towards the balloon, which was suspended from a rope between two poles. As he looked at the crazy machine in which he was about to risk his life, he wished he had not been so rash. The car was of wood and measured about nine feet across. In the centre was a large iron grating, from which a chimney extended several feet into the balloon. There was no netting, the car being simply fastened to cords stitched in the cloth. Trusses of straw with which to feed the furnace hung round. Burnaby's misgivings were in no way lessened when Goddard and his assistant started the fire. The flames roared up the chimney into the balloon, and sparks flew in all directions. Burnaby, however, was determined to go through with the matter, and when the balloon was fully distended, he went forward to take his place in the car. But Goddard refused to take him. He said there was not enough ascending power, and that he would willingly take him up another time. Burnaby retired and explained the situation to his friends, who laughed and hinted that he was afraid. Goddard gave the order, Let go! and the ponderous car rose slowly. It was about five feet from the ground, when Burnaby suddenly sprang forward, seized the edge of the car, and vaulted in. His weight was too much for the balloon, which sank again to the earth. More straw was piled on the furnace, and the machine again rose but in its ascent it came into collision with one of the masts, which broke in two like a pipe stalk. They got clear of the grounds without further accident, and sailed across the Thames, but there was little wind, and at no time did the Montgolfier rise more than 800 feet. Greenwich Marshes was the spot chosen as the landing place. The balloon grounded on the shore within a few yards of the river, and then rebounded. To the horror of the aeronauts, they saw the balloon making straight for a stone embankment. We can imagine the excitement of the aeronauts during the next few minutes, when we remember that the fire was still burning brightly and the roar of the furnace nearly drowned all other sounds. The primitive way in which the car was attached added another element of danger. Crash went the balloon against the stones, but by careful management the equilibrium of the car was preserved and what threatened to be a serious disaster was avoided. Shortly afterwards, the balloon was brought to a standstill, and the party alighted in safety. After this, 
Burnaby made a number of ascents from time to time, and as a member of the Aeronautical Society, he took an active interest in the practical scientific aspect of ballooning. This led on one occasion to a very strange adventure, which, however, is not without its amusing side. A Frenchman came forward with a balloon shaped in the form of a gigantic bladder pointed at both ends. In the car, machinery was fitted which, when set in motion, could be used to steer the balloon. The machinery consisted of two large wheels, which, on being turned, caused two sets of large fans to revolve. These were fixed over the car, and could be set at any angle, to suit the direction in which the aeronaut wished to travel. The inventor made arrangements to exhibit his machine, and give a practical demonstration of its working powers. Anxious to investigate the matter fully, Burnaby arranged to accompany him. The balloon was inflated. The inventor and his assistant and the captain took their seats in the car. But there was no ascent. Then the Frenchman called out, Now I will show you the great advantage of my invention. I will take ballast out until five pounds more taken away would cause the balloon to rise. We will then work the wheels, the screw fans will revolve. As they revolve, we shall leave the earth. Burnaby's interest had now reached the pitch of curiosity and he worked with his utmost strength at the wheels. But the united efforts of the aeronauts were in vain. Though the fans revolved at a tremendous pace, the car did not budge an inch. The people who had assembled to see this wonder laughed scornfully. Becoming tired of this fatiguing and fruitless labour, Burnaby took up a small bag of ballast which was lying near and quietly dropped it over the side. The balloon rose at once. The Frenchman thought the ascent was due to his invention and graciously bowed his acknowledgement to the cheers of the crowd. The wind blew the balloon towards the Thames. The day was cold and the gas condensed rapidly and the balloon began to descend. Trusting in his invention, the Frenchman paid no heed but worked away at the wheels. The descent continued in spite of the revolving fans. A moment more and they would be in the water. But Burnaby thinking that it would go badly with them all to fall into the water surrounded with ropes and netting, dropped a large bag of ballast overboard. Again the balloon ascended. The Frenchman's face relaxed, but his triumph was short-lived. The splash of the bag as it touched the water told him of the trick that had been played, and he was furiously indignant. Why? he asked Burnaby. Did you not trust to the fans? They lifted the balloon before, and would have done so this time if they had had a chance. The captain kept his own secret, and nothing more was said. The balloon ascended rapidly to a height of 3,000 feet, when something caused the Frenchman to look up, and instantly a look of horror came over his face. Burnaby followed his gaze, and saw that in the excitement of the start, they had forgotten to untie the neck of the balloon, and so allow for the expansion of the gas. Owing to the peculiar construction of the globe, It was absolutely impossible to reach the neck and undo the fastenings. 
There was therefore no resource but to sit and wait until the pressure of the atmosphere caused the balloon to burst. They were ascending rapidly, and a few moments must decide their fate. Suddenly, a cracking sound was heard, and the balloon dropped with frightful velocity. Each man held his breath. With equal suddenness, the downward rush was stayed, and on looking to see the cause, the aeronauts found that the lower part of the balloon had been forced into the upper part of the netting, thus forming a kind of parachute. They breathed freely again and prepared to land. In a few minutes they touched the earth about three miles from where the accident had occurred, thankful to have escaped without injury. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With Andre Across the Baltic. A few years ago, Salomon August Andre, one of the first engineers in Sweden and famous in this country for his attempt to reach the North Pole by balloon, made a remarkable flight over the Baltic Sea, a feat never before accomplished. For several months he had been engaged in making ascents solely for the purposes of scientific research, and on the 19th of October 1893 he went up to verify some of his observations. Having finished his work, he prepared to descend when suddenly, before he had time to open the ventilator, the balloon began falling of itself at a terrific speed. Down it went until it reached a white cloud, when it stopped and sailed round like a swan on the water for a few minutes. Then it sank through the cloud. Meanwhile, Andre had been too much occupied to notice the direction in which he was drifting, and the cloud prevented him from forming any idea of his whereabouts. When, however, he came through, he was greatly astonished to find himself sailing out over the Baltic. Certain death stared him in the face. He had no hope of escape, unless he could reach Finland or meet with a vessel. It was indeed a perilous position, but his presence of mind did not for a moment forsake him. Soon I saw, says he, through my glasses, a steamer trying to cross the way the balloon would take, and being straight in my course, it suddenly stopped. This action on the part of the steamer was simply madness, as the sparks in the smokestacks could easily light the gas in the balloon, amounting to some 16,000 cubic feet, the explosion of which, without doubt, would have killed many persons. Happily, the captain perceived the danger and moved his vessel round. Now it was my turn to try the best way of coming down. I threw out the anchor, and the speed of the balloon was slackened, but the steamer was still out of hearing. Then I fastened two empty ballast sacks on my last rope, and threw them into the water. The balloon nearly stopped. The steamer had by this time put out all fires, and could not come nearer, so that all hope of rescue by this means was at an end. Andre now saw that there was nothing for it but to try and reach the coast of Finland. He accordingly tried to get the ropes up from the water, but when he raised the first above the surface, 
the balloon sank under the additional weight. He therefore cut away the sandbags, and the balloon was carried forward by the wind at the rate of about 14 miles an hour. Shortly afterwards, he sighted another ship which offered him assistance, but the risk of descending was too great, and he declined, and continued on his perilous course. His previous experience had taught him that if he tried to go down to the surface while the vessel lay in his way, the balloon would have rebounded from the water, and he should have been thrown out and probably killed. The force of the wind was now greatly increased, and the balloon was speeding along at 18 miles an hour. It's kept at a height of about 800 feet above the surface, and although it often sank down very near the water, the car was never once dipped. To prevent such a catastrophe, André cut away the anchor, which he had been unable to raise. It was a bold act, but a necessary one. The wind began to blow still harder, and a little rain fell. Stronger and stronger blew the wind, and the aeronaut began to prepare for the worst. He enclosed his valuable observations in an airtight tin, and gave instructions where to send them if found, so that if disaster happened, they might be saved. It was getting dark when he passed over the first cliff on the coast of Finland. Shortly afterwards, the wind changed, and instead of blowing him into the interior of the country, it drove him along the coast. For ninety minutes I was standing on the edge of the car with some ballast in my hands, ready to throw it out in case of danger of collision with a cliff. Suddenly I saw a sharp light. I supposed it was a lighthouse, but there appeared now two, then three lights. It was evidently a building. For one moment I lost my presence of mind and failed to grapple the rope to the ventilator and hang on to it with all my powers. Now it was too late. I had passed the island and the balloon came down into the water. I was lying in the bottom of the car and the water rushed in with such force that I could not move. The most of the way to the next island, I was under water. But this could not continue. At length, after much turning and twisting, I succeeded in getting my legs over the edge of the car, just when the balloon swept over the next cliff. It was a wonder I escaped without having them broken. I tried several different positions, but the car was so unsteady that I was never safe. But I could not endure it much longer. I felt myself so feeble that it would have been an impossibility for me to try and hold the balloon. I had only one course now to pursue, to save my life. Passing over the next cliff, I jumped down. The balloon shot up in the air and disappeared. I was saved, but, alas, in what condition and for how long a time? I had hurt my leg in falling and could not stand, so I crept round the cliff in search of shelter. But none was to be found. It was now between seven and eight o'clock. For a couple of hours I shouted aloud in the hope that it would be heard by some passing boat, but the raging storm took away the sound of my voice. I then turned my attention to making myself as comfortable as possible for the night, though the prospects were anything but pleasant. I was wet through, 
my fur cap had blown away, and I had nothing to put on my head. This made me specially anxious, because my only chance of being rescued was to keep my head clear. I made a cap of some handkerchiefs and lay down on the cold ground, hungry and shivering, trying to keep up my courage, if not my temperature. So passed the long night. At length day dawned. I was now able to stand, and, with my glasses, which I had fortunately round my neck, I saw in the distance the island over which I had passed the night before. In order to draw attention to my position, I took off my trousers and waved them in the air. Shortly afterwards, I was glad to see a boat sail out from the island and steer straight for the place where I lay. I soon saw they had not set out in response to my signal, for the men never once looked in the direction of the cliff, and the boat passed me. I shouted myself hoarse, but in vain. I began to look about to see if I could make a raft out of the few trees there were, but as I had neither axe nor knife, I was obliged to give up the idea. When I returned to my sleeping place, I found a boat close by. A man on the island had seen a big square boat with an enormous sail come sailing from the sea with a terrific sweep and go flying over the ground and again disappear in the sea. This was my balloon, or rather his description of it, for the islanders had never seen anything of the kind before. His curiosity was aroused, and early in the morning he went down to the beach with his glasses to see if he could find out what the strange apparition could have been. He then saw my signals and put off at once to the rescue. I was quickly taken over to his home and well cared for. The balloon was afterwards recovered on another island some miles away, little the worse for the extraordinary voyage it had made. The value of this ascension from a scientific point of view was very great, and the courage of engineer André no less than his scientific qualifications, entitle him to rank among the most famous aeronauts of modern times. It is, however, in connection with his daring scheme to reach the North Pole by balloon, that André's name will be ever remembered. Impossible as it seemed to carry such a plan to a successful issue, the courageous aeronaut found many supporters among his own countrymen, who came forward with liberal funds for equipping the proposed expedition. A balloon was accordingly constructed, named the Eagle, capable of carrying three persons, a supply of provisions for four months, besides the necessary ballast and scientific instruments. The car contained a dark room for photography and a well-protected sleeping apartment for the three travellers. The roof of the rooms was bordered to form the floor of the upper story, which served as a sort of promenade deck. Dansko in Spitsbergen was chosen as the starting point, and thither accordingly the balloon was sent in the spring of 1896. On the 23rd of July it was inflated, and four days later everything was ready for launching. For two months André and his two companions, Eckholm and Strindberg, waited for a favourable breeze, but in vain. The wind continued contrary. Winter came on, and the expedition 
had to be abandoned. Undaunted by the failure of their first attempt, however, the explorers determined to return in the following spring. In the meantime, Eckholm withdrew from the enterprise, but André and Strindberg, who had never lost heart, returned to Spitsbergen in the summer of 1897 to wait for a favourable wind. This time their perseverance was rewarded. A brisk southerly breeze sprang up, and the balloon sailed northward over the weird white polar sea. Since then, the courageous aeronauts have not been heard of. Time alone will tell whether they have solved the problem of the ages and added to the store of the world's knowledge, or whether they swell the number of those who have perished in the attempt. End of chapter 16 End of Stories of Balloon Adventure by Frank Mundell